Chapter 15 of A Legend of Montrose. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. A Legend of Montrose by Sir Walter Scott. Chapter 15. But if no faithless action stain thy true and constant word, I'll make thee famous by my pen, and glorious by my sword. I'll serve thee in such noble ways as ne'er were known before. I'll deck and crown thy head with bays, and love thee more and more. Montrose's Lines We must now leave, with whatever regret, the valiant Captain Dalgetty, to recover of his wounds or otherwise as fate shall determine in order briefly to trace the military operations of montrose worthy as they are of a more important page and a better historian by the assistance of the chieftains whom we have commemorated and more especially by the junction of the murrays stuarts and other clans of athol which were peculiarly zealous in the royal cause he soon assembled an army of two or three thousand highlanders to whom he successfully united the irish under colkitto this last leader who to the great embarrassment of milton's commentators is commemorated in one of that great poet's sonnets was properly named alister or alexander macdonnell by birth a scottish isleman and related to the earl of antrim to whose patronage he owed the command assigned him in the irish troops in many respects he merited this distinction he was brave to intrepidity and almost to insensibility very strong and active in person completely master of his weapons and always ready to show the example in the extremity of danger to counterbalance these good qualities it must be recorded that he was inexperienced in military tactics and of a jealous and presumptuous disposition which often lost to montrose the fruits of colquito's gallantry yet such is the predominance of outward personal qualities in the eyes of a mild people that the feats of strength and courage shown by this champion seem to have made a stronger impression upon the minds of the highlanders than the military skill and chivalrous spirit of the great marquis of montrose numerous traditions are still preserved in the highland glens concerning alister macdonnell though the name of montrose is rarely mentioned among them milton's book entitled tetracordon has been ridiculed it would seem by the divines assembled at westminster and others on account of the hardness of the title and milton in his sonnet retaliates upon the barbarous scottish names which the civil war had made familiar to english ears why is it harder sirs than gordon colquito or macdonald or gallasp these rugged names to our like mouths grow sleek that would have made quintilian stare and gasp we may suppose says bishop newton that these were persons of note among the scotch ministers who were for pressing and enforcing the covenant whereas milton only intends to ridicule the barbarism of scottish names in general and quotes indiscriminately that of gillespie one of the apostles of the covenant and those of colquito and macdonnell both belonging to one person one of its bitterest enemies the point upon which montrose finally assembled his little army was in strathern on the verge of the highlands of perthshire so as to menace the principal town of that county his enemies were not unprepared for his reception argyle at the head of his highlanders was dogging the steps of the irish from the west to the east and by force fear or influence had collected an army nearly sufficient to have given battle to that under montrose the lowlands were also prepared 
for reasons which we assigned at the beginning of this tale a body of six thousand infantry and six or seven thousand cavalry which profanely assumed the title of god's army had been hastily assembled from the shires of fife angus perth stirling and the neighbouring counties a much less force in former times nay even in the preceding reign would have been sufficient to have secured the lowlands against a more formidable descent of highlanders than those united under montrose but times had changed strangely within the last half century before that period the lowlanders were as constantly engaged in war as the mountaineers and were incomparably better disciplined and armed the favorite scottish order of battle somewhat resembled the macedonian phalanx their infantry formed a compact body armed with long spears impenetrable even to the men-at-arms of the age though well mounted and arrayed in complete proof it may easily be conceived therefore that their ranks could not be broken by the disorderly charge of highland infantry armed for close combat only with swords and ill-furnished with missile weapons and having no artillery whatever this habit of fight was in a great measure changed by the introduction of muskets into the scottish lowland service which not being as yet combined with the bayonet was a formidable weapon at a distance but gave no assurance against the enemy who rushed on to close quarters the pike indeed was not wholly disused in the scottish army but it was no longer the favorite weapon nor was it relied upon as formerly by those in whose hands it was placed insomuch that daniel lupton a tactician of the day has written a book expressly upon the superiority of the musket this change commenced as early as the wars of gustavus adolphus whose marches were made with such rapidity that the pike was very soon thrown aside in his army and exchanged for firearms a circumstance which necessarily accompanied this change as well as the establishment of standing armies whereby war became a trade was the introduction of a laborious and complicated system of discipline combining a variety of words of command with corresponding operations and manoeuvres the neglect of any one of which was sure to throw the whole into confusion war therefore as practised among most nations of europe had assumed much more than formerly the character of a profession or mystery to which previous practice and experience were indispensable requisites such was the natural consequence of standing armies which had almost everywhere and particularly in the long german wars superseded what may be called the natural discipline of the feudal militia the scottish lowland militia therefore labored under a double disadvantage when opposed to highlanders they were divested of the spear a weapon which in the hands of their ancestors had so often repelled the impetuous assaults of the mountaineer and they were subjected to a new and complicated species of discipline well adapted perhaps to the use of regular troops who could be rendered completely masters of it but tending only to confuse the ranks of citizen soldiers by whom it was rarely practised and imperfectly understood so much has been done in our own time in bringing back tactics to their first principles and in getting rid of the pedantry of war that it is easy for us to estimate the disadvantages under which a half-trained militia labored who were taught to consider success as depending upon their exercising with precision a system of tactics which they probably only so far comprehended as to find out when they were wrong but without the power of getting right again neither can it be denied that in the material points of military habits and warlike spirit the lowlanders of the seventeenth century had sunk far beneath their highland countrymen 
from the earliest period down to the union of the crowns the whole kingdom of scotland lowlands as well as highlands had been the constant scene of war foreign and domestic and there was probably scarce one of its hardy inhabitants between the age of sixteen and sixty who was not as willing in point of fact as he was literally bound in law to assume arms at the first call of his liege lord or of a royal proclamation the law remained the same in sixteen hundred and forty five as a hundred years before but the race of those subjected to it had been bred up under very different feelings they had sat in quiet under their vine and under their fig tree and a call to battle involved a change of life as new as it was disagreeable such of them also who lived near unto the highlands were in continual and disadvantageous contact with the restless inhabitants of those mountains by whom their cattle were driven off their dwellings plundered and their persons insulted and who had acquired over them that sort of superiority arising from a constant system of aggression the lowlanders who lay more remote and out of reach of these depredations were influenced by the exaggerated reports circulated concerning the highlanders whom as totally differing in laws language and dress they were induced to regard as a nation of savages equally void of fear and of humanity these various prepossessions joined to the less warlike habits of the lowlanders and their imperfect knowledge of the new and complicated system of discipline for which they had exchanged their natural mode of fighting placed them at great disadvantage when opposed to the highlander in the field of battle the mountaineers on the contrary with the arms and courage of their fathers possessed also their simple and natural system of tactics and bore down with the fullest confidence upon an enemy to whom anything they had been taught of discipline was like saul's armor upon david a hindrance rather than a help because they had not proved it it was with such disadvantages on the one side and such advantages on the other to counterbalance the difference of superior numbers and the presence of artillery and cavalry that montrose encountered the army of lord elcho upon the field of tippermuir the presbyterian clergy had not been wanting in their efforts to rouse the spirit of their followers and one of them who harangued the troops on the very day of battle hesitated not to say that if ever god spoke by his mouth he promised them in his name that day a great and assured victory the cavalry and artillery were also reckoned sure warrants of success as the novelty of their attack had upon former occasions been very discouraging to the highlanders the place of meeting was an open heath and the ground afforded little advantage to either party except that it allowed the horse of the covenanters to act with effect a battle upon which so much depended was never more easily decided the lowland cavalry made a show of charging but whether thrown into disorder by the fire of musketry or deterred by a disaffection to the service said to have prevailed among the gentlemen they made no impression on the highlanders whatever and recoiled in disorder from ranks which had neither bayonets nor pikes to protect them montrose saw and instantly availed himself of this advantage he ordered his whole army to charge which they performed with the wild and desperate valor peculiar to mountaineers one officer of the covenanters alone trained in the italian wars made a desperate defence upon the right wing in every other point their line was penetrated at the first onset and this advantage once obtained the lowlanders were utterly unable to contend at close quarters with their more agile and athletic enemies many were slain on the held and such a number in the pursuit 
that above one-third of the covenanters were reported to have fallen in which number however must be computed a great many fat burgesses who broke their wind in the flight and thus died without stroke of sword we choose to quote our authority for a fact so singular a great many burgesses were killed twenty-five householders in st andrews many were bursten in the flight and died without stroke c bailey's letters volume two page ninety two the victors obtained possession of perth and obtained considerable sums of money as well as ample supplies of arms and ammunition but those advantages were to be balanced against an almost insurmountable inconvenience that uniformly attended a highland army the clans could be in no respect induced to consider themselves as regular soldiers or to act as such even so late as the year seventeen forty five to seventeen forty six when the chevalier charles edward by way of making an example caused a soldier to be shot for desertion the highlanders who composed his army were affected as much by indignation as by fear they could not conceive any principle of justice upon which a man's life could be taken for merely going home when it did not suit him to remain longer with the army such had been the uniform practice of their fathers when a battle was over the campaign was in their opinion ended if it was lost they sought safety in their mountains if won they returned there to secure their booty at other times they had their cattle to look after and their harvests to sow or reap without which their families would have perished for want in either case there was an end of their services for the time and though they were easily enough recalled by the prospect of fresh adventures and more plunder yet the opportunity of success was in the meantime lost and could not afterwards be recovered this circumstance serves to show even if history had not made us acquainted with the same fact that the highlanders had never been accustomed to make war with the view of permanent conquest but only with the hope of deriving temporary advantage or deciding some immediate quarrel it also explains the reason why montrose with all his splendid successes never obtained any secure or permanent footing in the lowlands and why even those lowland noblemen and gentlemen who were inclined to the royal cause showed diffidence and reluctance to join an army of a character so desultory and irregular as might lead them at all times to apprehend that the highlanders securing themselves by a retreat to their mountains would leave whatever lowlanders might have joined them to the mercy of an offended and predominant enemy the same consideration will also serve to account for the sudden marches which montrose was obliged to undertake in order to recruit his army in the mountains and for the rapid changes of fortune by which we often find him obliged to retreat from before those enemies over whom he had recently been victorious if there should be any who read these tales for any further purpose than that of immediate amusement they will find these remarks not unworthy of their recollection it was owing to such causes the slackness of the lowland loyalists and the temporary desertion of his highland followers that montrose found himself even after the decisive victory of tippermuir in no condition to face the second army with which argyle advanced upon him from the westward in this emergency supplying by velocity the want of strength he moved suddenly from perth to dundee and being refused admission into that town fell northward upon aberdeen where he expected to be joined by the gordons and other loyalists but the zeal of these gentlemen was for the time effectually bridled by a large body of covenanters commanded by the lord burleigh and supposed to amount to three thousand men these montrose boldly attacked with half their number the battle was fought under the walls of the city 
and the resolute valor of montrose's followers was again successful against every disadvantage but it was the fate of this great commander always to gain the glory but seldom to reap the fruits of victory he had scarcely time to repose his small army in aberdeen ere he found on the one hand that the gordons were likely to be deterred from joining him by the reasons we have mentioned with some others peculiar to their chief the marquis of huntley on the other hand argyle whose forces had been augmented by those of several lowland noblemen advanced towards montrose at the head of an army much larger than he had yet had to cope with these troops moved indeed with slowness corresponding to the cautious character of their commander but even that caution rendered argyle's approach formidable since his very advance implied that he was at the head of an army irresistibly superior there remained one mode of retreat open to montrose and he adopted it he threw himself into the highlands where he could set pursuit at defiance and where he was sure in every glen to recover those recruits who had left his standard to deposit their booty in their native fastnesses it was thus that the singular character of the army which montrose commanded while on the one hand it rendered his victory in some degree nugatory enabled him on the other under the most disadvantageous circumstances to secure his retreat recruit his forces and render himself more formidable than ever to the enemy before whom he had lately been unable to make a stand on the present occasion he threw himself into badenoch and rapidly traversing that district as well as the neighboring country of athol he alarmed the covenanters by successive attacks upon various unexpected points and spread such general dismay that repeated orders were dispatched by the parliament to argyle their commander to engage and disperse montrose at all rates these commands from his superiors neither suited the haughty spirit nor the temporizing and cautious policy of the nobleman to whom they were addressed he paid accordingly no regard to them but limited his efforts to intrigues among montrose's few lowland followers many of whom had become disgusted with the prospect of a highland campaign which exposed their persons to intolerable fatigue and left their estates at the covenanter's mercy accordingly several of them left montrose's camp at this period he was joined however by a body of forces of more congenial spirit and far better adapted to the situation in which he found himself this reinforcement consisted of a large body of highlanders whom colkitto dispatched for that purpose had levied in argyleshire among the most distinguished was john of moidart called the captain of clan ronald with the stuarts of appin the clan gregor the clan macnab and other tribes of inferior distinction by these means montrose's army was so formidably increased that argyle cared no longer to remain in the command of that opposed to him but returned to edinburgh and there threw up his commission under pretence that his army was not supplied with reinforcements and provisions in the manner in which they ought to have been from thence the marquis returned to inverary there in full security to govern his feudal vassals and patriarchal followers and to repose himself in safety on the faith of the clan proverb already quoted it is a far cry to lochow End of chapter 15chapter 16 of a legend of montrose this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah a legend of montrose by sir walter scott chapter 16 such mountains steep such craggy hills 
his army on one side enclose the other side great grisly gills did fence with fenny mire and moss which when the earl understood he counsel craved of captains all who bade set forth with mournful mood and take such fortune as would fall flodden field an ancient poem montrose had now a splendid career in his view provided he could obtain the consent of his gallant but desultory troops and their independent chieftains the lowlands lay open before him without an army adequate to check his career for argyle's followers had left the covenanter's host when their master threw up his commission and many other troops tired of the war had taken the same opportunity to disband themselves by descending strath tay therefore one of the most convenient passes from the highlands montrose had only to present himself in the lowlands in order to rouse the slumbering spirit of chivalry and of loyalty which animated the gentlemen to the north of the fourth the possession of these districts with or without a victory would give him the command of a wealthy and fertile part of the kingdom and would enable him by regular pay to place his army on a permanent footing to penetrate as far as the capital perhaps from thence to the border where he deemed it possible to communicate with the yet unsubdued forces of king charles such was the plan of operations by which the truest glory was to be acquired and the most important success ensured for the royal cause accordingly it did not escape the ambitious and daring spirit of him whose services had already acquired him the title of the great marquis but other motives actuated many of his followers and perhaps were not without their secret and unacknowledged influence upon his own feelings the western chiefs in montrose's army almost to a man regarded the marquis of argyle as the most direct and proper object of hostilities almost all of them had felt his power almost all in withdrawing their fencible men from their own glens left their families and property exposed to his vengeance all without exception were desirous of diminishing his sovereignty and most of them lay so near his territories that they might reasonably hope to be gratified by a share of his spoil to these chiefs the possession of inverary and its castle was an event infinitely more important and desirable than the capture of edinburgh the latter event could only afford their clansmen a little transitory pay or plunder the former ensured to the chiefs themselves indemnity for the past and security for the future besides these personal reasons the leaders who favored this opinion plausibly urged that though at his first descent into the lowlands montrose might be superior to the enemy yet every day's march he made from the hills must diminish his own forces and expose him to the accumulated superiority of any army which the covenanters could collect from the lowland levies and garrisons on the other hand by crushing argyle effectually he would not only permit his present western friends to bring out that proportion of their forces which they must otherwise leave at home for protection of their families but farther he would draw to his standard several tribes already friendly to his cause but who were prevented from joining him by fear of Macallum more these arguments as we have already hinted found something responsive in montrose's own bosom not quite consonant with the general heroism of his character the houses of argyle and montrose had been in former times repeatedly opposed to each other in war and in politics and the superior advantages acquired by the former had made them the subject of envy and dislike to the neighboring family who conscious of equal desert had not been so richly rewarded 
this was not all the existing heads of these rival families had stood in the most marked opposition to each other since the commencement of the present troubles montrose conscious of the superiority of his talents and of having rendered great service to the covenanters at the beginning of the war had expected from that party the supereminence of counsel and command which they judged it safer to entrust to the more limited faculties and more extensive power of his rival argyle the having awarded this preference was an injury which montrose never forgave the covenanters and he was still less likely to extend his pardon to argyle to whom he had been postponed he was therefore stimulated by every feeling of hatred which could animate a fiery temper in a fierce age to seek for revenge upon the enemy of his house and person and it is probable that these private motives operated not a little upon his mind when he found the principal part of his followers determined rather to undertake an expedition against the territories of argyle than to take the far more decisive step of descending at once into the lowlands yet whatever temptation montrose found to carry into effect his attack upon argyleshire he could not easily bring himself to renounce the splendid achievement of a descent upon the lowlands he held more than one council with the principal chiefs combating perhaps his own secret inclination as well as theirs he laid before them the extreme difficulty of marching even a highland army from the eastward into argyleshire through passes scarcely practicable for shepherds and deerstalkers and over mountains with which even the clans lying nearest to them did not pretend to be thoroughly acquainted these difficulties were greatly enhanced by the season of the year which was now advancing towards december when the mountain passes in themselves so difficult might be expected to be rendered utterly impassable by snowstorms these objections neither satisfied nor silenced the chiefs who insisted upon their ancient mode of making war by driving the cattle which according to the gaelic phrase fed upon the grass of their enemy the council was dismissed late at night and without coming to any decision excepting that the chiefs who supported the opinion that argyle should be invaded promised to seek out among their followers those who might be most capable of undertaking the office of guides upon the expedition montrose had retired to the cabin which served him for a tent and stretched himself upon a bed of dry fern the only place of repose which it afforded but he courted sleep in vain for the visions of ambition excluded those of morpheus in one moment he imagined himself displaying the royal banner from the reconquered castle of edinburgh detaching assistance to a monarch whose crown depended upon his success and receiving in requital all the advantages and preferments which could be heaped upon him whom a king delighteth to honour at another time this dream splendid as it was faded before the vision of gratified vengeance and personal triumph over a personal enemy to surprise argyle in his stronghold of inverary to crush in him at once the rival of his own house and the chief support of the presbyterians to show the covenanters the difference between the preferred argyle and the postponed montrose was a picture too flattering to feudal vengeance to be easily relinquished while he lay thus busied with contradictory thoughts and feelings the soldier who stood sentinel upon his quarters announced to the marquis that two persons desired to speak with his excellency their names answered montrose and the cause of their urgency at such a late hour on these points the sentinel who was one of colquito's irishmen could afford his general little information so that montrose who at such a period durst refuse access to no one 
lest he might have been neglecting some important intelligence gave directions as a necessary precaution to put the guard under arms and then prepared to receive his untimely visitors his groom of the chambers had scarce lighted a pair of torches and montrose himself had scarce risen from his couch when two men entered one wearing a lowland dress of chamois leather worn almost to tatters the other a tall upright old highlander of a complexion which might be termed iron grey wasted and worn by frost and tempest what may be your commands with me my friends said the marquis his hand almost unconsciously seeking the butt of one of his pistols for the period as well as the time of night warranted suspicions which the good mien of his visitors was not by any means calculated to remove i pray leave to congratulate you said the lowlander my most noble general and right honourable lord upon the great battles which you have achieved since i had the fortune to be detached from you it was a pretty affair that tulsi at tippermuir nevertheless if i might be permitted to counsel before doing so said the marquis will you be pleased to let me know who is so kind as to favour me with his opinion truly my lord replied the man i should have hoped that was unnecessary seeing it is not so long since i took on in your service under promise of a commission as major with half a dollar of daily pay and half a dollar of arrears and i am to trust your lordship has not forgotten my pay as well as my person my good friend major dalgetty said montrose who by this time perfectly recollected his man you must consider what important things have happened to put my friends faces out of my memory besides this imperfect light but all conditions shall be kept and what news from argyleshire my good major we have long given you up for lost and i was now preparing to take the most signal vengeance upon the old fox who infringed the law of arms in your person truly my noble lord said dalgetty i have no desire that my return should put any stop to so proper and becoming an intention verily it is in no shape in the earl of argyle's favour or mercy that i now stand before you and i shall be no intercessor for him but my escape is under heaven and the excellent dexterity which as an old and accomplished cavalier i displayed in effecting the same i say under these it is owing to the assistance of this old highlander whom i venture to recommend to your lordship's special favour as the instrument of saving your lordship's to command dougal dalgetty of drumthwacket a thankworthy service said the marquis gravely which shall certainly be requited in the manner it deserves kneel down ronald said major dalgetty as we must now call him kneel down and kiss his excellency's hand the prescribed form of acknowledgment not being according to the custom of ronald's country he contented himself with folding his arms on his bosom and making a low inclination of his head this poor man my lord said major dalgetty continuing his speech with a dignified air of protection towards ronald mackay has strained all his slender means to defend my person from mine enemies although having no better weapons of a missile sort than bows and arrows whilk your lordship will hardly believe you will see a great many such weapons in my camp said montrose and we find them serviceable in fact for the admirers of archery it may be stated not only that many of the highlanders in montrose's army used these antique missiles but even in england the bow and quiver once the glory of the bold yeomen of that land were occasionally used during the great civil wars serviceable my lord said dalgetty i trust your lordship will permit me to be surprised bows and arrows i trust you will forgive my recommending the substitution of muskets the first convenient opportunity but besides defending me this honest highlander 
also was at the pains of curing me in respect that i had got a touch of the wars in my retreat which merits my best requital in this special introduction of him to your lordship's notice and protection what is your name my friend said montrose turning to the highlander it may not be spoken answered the mountaineer that is to say interpreted major dalgetty he desires to have his name concealed in respect he hath in former days taken a castle slain certain children and done other things whilk as your good lordship knows are often practised in war time but excite no benevolence towards the perpetrator in the friends of those who sustain injury i have known in my military experience many brave cavaliers put to death by the boars simply for having used military license upon the country i understand said montrose this person is at feud with some of our followers let him retire to the court of guard and we will think of the best mode of protecting him you hear ronald said major dalgetty with an air of superiority his excellency wishes to hold privy council with me you must go to the court of guard he does not know where that is poor fellow he is a young soldier for so old a man i will put him under the charge of a sentinel and return to your lordship incontinent he did so and returned accordingly montrose's first enquiry respected the embassy to inverary and he listened with attention to dalgetty's reply notwithstanding the prolixity of the major's narrative it required an effort from the marquis to maintain his attention but no one better knew that where information is to be derived from the report of such agents as dalgetty it can only be obtained by suffering them to tell their story in their own way accordingly the marquis's patience was at length rewarded among other spoils which the captain thought himself at liberty to take was a packet of argyle's private papers these he consigned to the hands of his general a humour of accounting however which went no farther for i do not understand that he made any mention of the purse of gold which he had appropriated at the same time that he made seizure of the papers aforesaid snatching a torch from the wall montrose was in an instant deeply engaged in the perusal of these documents in which it is probable he found something to animate his personal resentment against his rival argyle does he not fear me said he then he shall feel me will he fire my castle of murdoch inverary shall raise the first smoke oh for a guide through the skirts of strath fillin whatever might be dalgetty's personal conceit he understood his business sufficiently to guess at montrose's meaning he instantly interrupted his own prolix narrative of the skirmish which had taken place and the wound he had received in his retreat and began to speak to the point which he saw interested his general if said he your excellency wishes to make an infall into argyleshire this poor man ronald of whom i told you together with his children and companions know every pass into that land both leading from the east and from the north indeed said montrose what reason have you to believe their knowledge so extensive so please your excellency answered dalgetty during the weeks that i remained with them for cure of my wound they were repeatedly obliged to shift their quarters in respect of argyle's repeated attempts to repossess himself of the person of an officer who was honoured with your excellency's confidence so that i had occasion to admire the singular dexterity and knowledge of the face of the country with which they alternately achieved their retreat and their advance and when at length i was able to repair to your excellency's standard this honest simple creature ronald mackay guided me by paths which my steed gustavus which your lordship may remember trode with perfect safety so that i said to myself 
that where guides spies or intelligencers were required in a highland campaign in that western country more expert persons than he and his attendants could not possibly be desired and can you answer for this man's fidelity said montrose what is his name and condition he is an outlaw and robber by profession something also of a homicide or murderer answered dalgetty and by name called ronald mackay whilk signifies ronald the son of the mist i should remember something of that name said montrose pausing did not these children of the mist perpetrate some act of cruelty upon the macaulays major dalgetty mentioned the circumstance of the murder of the forester and montrose's active memory at once recalled all the circumstances of the feud it is most unlucky said montrose this inexpiable quarrel between these men and the macaulays allan has borne himself bravely in these wars and possesses by the wild mystery of his behaviour and language so much influence over the minds of his countrymen that the consequences of disobliging him might be serious at the same time these men being so capable of rendering useful service and being as you say major dalgetty perfectly trustworthy i will pledge my pay and arrears my horse and arms my head and neck upon their fidelity said the major and your excellency knows that a soldado could say no more for his own father true said montrose but as this is a matter of particular moment i would willingly know the grounds of so positive an assurance concisely then my lord said the major not only did they disdain to profit by a handsome reward which argyle did me the honour to place upon this poor head of mine and not only did they abstain from pillaging my personal property whilk was to an amount that would have tempted regular soldiers in any service of europe and not only did they restore me my horse whilk your excellency knows to be of value but i could not prevail on them to accept one stiver doit or maravetti for the trouble and expenses of my sick-bed they actually refused my coined money when freely offered a tale seldom to be told in a christian land i admit said montrose after a moment's reflection that their conduct towards you is good evidence of their fidelity but how to secure against the breaking out of this feud he paused and then suddenly added i had forgot i have supped while you major have been travelling by moonlight he called to his attendants to fetch a stoop of wine and some refreshments major dalgetty who had the appetite of a convalescent returned from highland quarters needed not any pressing to partake of what was set before him but proceeded to dispatch his food with such alacrity that the marquis filling a cup of wine and drinking to his health could not help remarking that coarse as the provisions of his camp were he was afraid major dalgetty had fared much worse during his excursion into argyleshire your excellency may take your corporal oath upon that said the worthy major speaking with his mouth full for argyle's bread and water are yet stale and mouldy in my recollection and though they did their best yet the viands that the children of the mist procured for me poor helpless creatures as they were were so unrefreshful to my body that when enclosed in my armour whilk i was fain to leave behind me for expedition's sake i rattled therein like the shrivelled kernel in a nut that hath been kept on to a second halloween you must take the due means to repair these losses major dalgetty in troth answered the soldier i shall hardly be able to compass that unless my arrears are to be exchanged for present pay for i protest to your excellency that the three stone weight which i have lost were simply raised upon the regular accountings of the states of holland in that case said the marquis 
you are only reduced to good marching order as for the pay let us once have victory victory major and your wishes and all our wishes shall be amply fulfilled meantime help yourself to another cup of wine to your excellency's health said the major filling a cup to the brim to show the zeal with which he drank the toast and victory over all our enemies and particularly over argyle i hope to twitch another handful from his board myself i have had one pluck at it already very true answered montrose but to return to those men of the mist you understand dalgetty that their presence here and the purpose for which we employ them is a secret between you and me delighted as montrose had anticipated with this remark of his general's confidence the major laid his hand upon his nose and nodded intelligence how many may there be of ronald's followers continued the marquis they are reduced so far as i know to some eight or ten men answered major dalgetty and a few women and children where are they now demanded montrose in a valley at three miles distance answered the soldier awaiting your excellency's command i judged it not fit to bring them to your leaguer without your excellency's orders you judged very well said montrose it would be proper that they remain where they are or seek some more distant place of refuge i will send them money though it is a scarce article with me at present it is quite unnecessary said major dalgetty your excellency has only to hint that the macaulays are going in that direction and my friends of the mist will instantly make volta face and go to the right about that were scarce courteous said the marquis better send them a few dollars to purchase them some cattle for the support of the women and children they know how to come by their cattle at a far cheaper rate said the major but let it be as your excellency wills let ronald mackay said montrose select one or two of his followers men whom he can trust and who are capable of keeping their own secret and ours these with their chief for scoutmaster general shall serve for our guides let them be at my tent to-morrow at daybreak and see if possible that they neither guess my purpose nor hold any communication with each other in private this old man has he any children they have been killed or hanged answered the major to the number of a round dozen as i believe but he hath left one grandchild a smart and hopeful youth whom i have noted to be never without a pebble in his plaid nook to fling at whatsoever might come in his way being a symbol that like david who was accustomed to sling smooth stones taken from the brook he may afterwards prove an adventurous warrior that boy major dalgetty said the marquis i will have to attend upon my own person i presume he will have sense enough to keep his name secret your excellency need not fear that answered dalgetty these highland imps from the moment they chip the shell well interrupted montrose that boy shall be pledge for the fidelity of his parent and if he prove faithful the child's preferment shall be his reward and now major dalgetty i will license your departure for the night to-morrow you will introduce this mackay under any name or character he may please to assume i presume his profession has rendered him sufficiently expert in all sorts of disguises or we may admit john of moidart into our schemes who has sense practicability and intelligence and will probably allow this man for a time to be disguised as one of his followers for you major my groom of the chambers will be your quartermaster for this evening major dalgetty took his leave with a joyful heart greatly elated with the reception he had met with and much pleased with the personal manners of his new general which as he explained at great length to ronald mackay reminded him in many respects 
of the demeanour of the immortal gustavus adolphus the lion of the north and bulwark of the protestant faith End of chapter sixteen Chapter Seventeen of A Legend of Montrose. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. A Legend of Montrose by Sir Walter Scott. Chapter Seventeen. The march begins in military state and nations on his eyes suspended wait stern famine guards the solitary coast and winter barricades the realms of frost he comes nor want nor cold his course delay vanity of human wishes by break of day montrose received in his cabin old mackay and questioned him long and particularly as to the means of approaching the country of argyle he made a note of his answers which he compared with those of two of his followers whom he introduced as the most prudent and experienced he found them to correspond in all respects but still unsatisfied where precaution was so necessary the marquis compared the information he had received with that he was able to collect from the chiefs who lay most near to the destined scene of invasion and being in all respects satisfied of its accuracy he resolved to proceed in full reliance upon it in one point montrose changed his mind having judged it unfit to take the boy kenneth into his own service lest in case of his birth being discovered it should be resented as an offence by the numerous clans who entertained a feudal enmity to this devoted family he requested the major to take him in attendance upon himself and as he accompanied this request with a handsome douceur under pretence of clothing and equipping the lad this change was agreeable to all parties it was about breakfast time when major dalgetty being dismissed by montrose went in quest of his old acquaintances lord menteith and the macaulays to whom he longed to communicate his own adventures as well as to learn from them the particulars of the campaign it may be imagined he was received with great glee by men to whom the late uniformity of their military life had rendered any change of society an interesting novelty allan macaulay alone seemed to recoil from his former acquaintance although when challenged by his brother he could render no other reason than a reluctance to be familiar with one who had been so lately in the company of argyle and other enemies major dalgetty was a little alarmed by this sort of instinctive consciousness which allan seemed to entertain respecting the society he had been lately keeping he was soon satisfied however that the perceptions of the seer in this particular were not infallible as ronald mackay was to be placed under major dalgetty's protection and superintendence it was necessary he should present him to those persons with whom he was most likely to associate the dress of the old man had in the meantime been changed from the tartan of his clan to a sort of clothing peculiar to the men of the distant isles resembling a waistcoat with sleeves and a petticoat all made in one piece this dress was laced from top to bottom in front and bore some resemblance to that called polonaise still worn by children in scotland of the lower rank the tartan hose and bonnet completed the dress which old men of the last century remembered well to have seen worn by the distant islemen who came to the earl of mars standard in the year seventeen fifteen major dalgetty keeping his eye on allan as he spoke introduced ronald mackay under the fictitious name of ronald mcgillahurran in benbecula 
who had escaped with him out of argyle's prison he recommended him as a person skilful in the arts of the harper and the senachi and by no means contemptible in the quality of a second-sided person or seer while making this exposition major dalgetty stammered and hesitated in a way so unlike the usual glib forwardness of his manner that he could not have failed to have given suspicion to allan m'aulay had not that person's whole attention been engaged in steadily perusing the features of the person thus introduced to him this steady gaze so much embarrassed ronald mackay that his hand was beginning to sink down towards his dagger in expectation of a hostile assault when allan suddenly crossing the floor of his hut extended his hand to him in the way of friendly greeting they sat down side by side and conversed in a low mysterious tone of voice menteith and angus m'aulay were not surprised at this for there prevailed among the highlanders who pretended to the second sight a sort of freemasonry which generally induced them upon meeting to hold communication with each other on the nature and extent of their visionary experiences does the sight come gloomy upon your spirits said allan to his new acquaintance as dark as the shadow upon the moon replied ronald when she is darkened in her mid-course in heaven and prophets foretell of evil times come hither said allan come more this way i would converse with you apart for men say that in your distant islands the sight is poured forth with more clearness and power than upon us who dwell near the sassanac while they were plunged into their mystic conference the two english cavaliers entered the cabin in the highest possible spirits and announced to angus m'aulay that orders had been issued that all should hold themselves in readiness for an immediate march to the westward having delivered themselves of their news with much glee they paid their compliments to their old acquaintance major dalgetty whom they instantly recognized and inquired after the health of his charger gustavus i humbly thank you gentlemen answered the soldier gustavus is well though like his master somewhat bearer on the ribs than when you offered to relieve me of him at darlinverac and let me assure you that before you have made one or two of those marches which you seem to contemplate with so much satisfaction in prospect you will leave my good knights some of your english beef and probably an english horse or two behind you both exclaimed that they cared very little what they found or what they left provided the scene changed from dogging up and down angus and aberdeenshire in pursuit of an enemy who would neither fight nor run away if such be the case said angus m'aulay i must give orders to my followers and make provision too for the safe conveyance of annot lyle for an advance into m'callum moore's country will be a farther and fouler road than these pinks of cumbrian knighthood are aware of so saying he left the cabin annot lyle repeated dalgetty is she following the campaign surely replied sir giles musgrave his eye glancing slightly from lord menteith to allan m'aulay we could neither march nor fight advance nor retreat without the influence of the princess of harps the princess of broadswords and targets i say answered his companion for the lady of montrose herself could not be more courteously waited upon she has four highland maidens and as many bare-legged gillies to wait upon her orders and what would you have gentlemen said allan turning suddenly from the highlander with whom he was in conversation would you yourselves have left an innocent female the companion of your infancy to die by violence or perish by famine there is not by this time a roof upon the habitation of my fathers our crops have been destroyed and our cattle have been driven and you gentlemen have to bless god that coming from a milder and more civilized country 
you expose only your own lives in this remorseless war without apprehension that your enemies will visit with their vengeance the defenceless pledges you may have left behind you the englishmen cordially agreed that they had the superiority in this respect and the company now dispersing went each to his several charge or occupation allan lingered a moment behind still questioning the reluctant ronald mackay upon a point in his supposed visions by which he was greatly perplexed repeatedly he said have i had the sight of a gale which seemed to plunge his weapon into the body of menteith of that young nobleman in the scarlet laced cloak who has just now left the bothy but by no effort though i have gazed till my eyes were almost fixed in the sockets can i discover the face of this highlander or even conjecture who he may be although this person and heir seem familiar to me have you reversed your own plaid said ronald according to the rule of the experienced seers in such case i have answered allan speaking low and shuddering as if with internal agony and in what guise did the phantom then appear to you said ronald with his plaid also reversed answered allan in the same low and convulsed tone then be assured said ronald that your own hand and none other will do the deed of which you have witnessed the shadow so has my anxious soul a hundred times surmised replied allan but it is impossible were i to read the record in the eternal book of fate i would declare it impossible we are bound by the ties of blood and by a hundred ties more intimate we have stood side by side in battle and our swords have reeked with the blood of the same enemies it is impossible i should harm him that you will do so answered ronald is certain though the cause be hid in the darkness of futurity you say he continued suppressing his own emotions with difficulty that side by side you have pursued your prey like bloodhounds have you never seen bloodhounds turn their fangs against each other and fight over the body of a throttled deer it is false said macaulay starting up these are not the forebodings of fate but the temptation of some evil spirit from the bottomless pit so saying he strode out of the cabin thou hast it said the son of the mist looking after him with an air of exultation the barbed arrow is in thy side spirits of the slaughtered rejoice soon shall your murderers swords be dyed in each other's blood on the succeeding morning all was prepared and montrose advanced by rapid marches up the river tay and poured his desultory forces into the romantic vale around the lake of the same name which lies at the head of that river the inhabitants were campbells not indeed the vassals of argyle but of the allied and kindred house of glenorchy which now bears the name of Bredelbane. being taken by surprise they were totally unprepared for resistance and were compelled to be passive witnesses of the ravages which took place among their flocks and herds advancing in this manner to the vale of loch dochart and laying waste the country around him montrose reached the most difficult point of his enterprise to a modern army even with the assistance of the good military road which now leads up by tenedrum to the head of loch ah the passage of these extensive wilds would seem a task of some difficulty but at this period and for long afterwards there was no road or path whatsoever and to add to the difficulty the mountains were already covered with snow it was a sublime scene to look up to them piled in great masses one upon another the front rank of dazzling whiteness while those which arose behind them caught a rosy tint from the setting of a clear wintry sun ben cruachan superior in magnitude and seeming the very citadel of the genius of the region rose high above the others showing his glimmering 
and scathed peak to the distance of many miles the followers of montrose were men not to be daunted by the sublime yet terrible prospect before them many of them were of that ancient race of highlanders who not only willingly made their couch in the snow but considered it as effeminate luxury to use a snowball for a pillow plunder and revenge lay beyond the frozen mountains which they beheld and they did not permit themselves to be daunted by the difficulty of traversing them montrose did not allow their spirits time to subside he ordered the pipes to play in the van the ancient pibroch entitled hogel nam bo etc that is we come through snowdrift to drive the prey the shrilling sounds of which had often struck the vales of the lennox with terror it is the family march of the macfarlands a warlike and predatory clan who inhabited the western banks of loch lomond see waverley note fifteen the troops advanced with the nimble alacrity of mountaineers and were soon involved in the dangerous pass through which ronald acted as their guide going before them with a select party to track out the way the power of man at no time appears more contemptible than when it is placed in contrast with scenes of natural terror and dignity the victorious army of montrose whose exploits had struck terror into all scotland when ascending up this terrific pass seemed a contemptible handful of stragglers in the act of being devoured by the jaws of the mountain which appeared ready to close upon them even montrose half repented the boldness of his attempt as he looked down from the summit of the first eminence which he attained upon the scattered condition of his small army the difficulty of getting forward was so great that considerable gaps began to occur in the line of march and the distance between the van centre and rear was each moment increased in a degree equally incommodious and dangerous it was with great apprehension that montrose looked upon every point of advantage which the hill afforded in dread it might be found occupied by an enemy prepared for defence and he often afterwards was heard to express his conviction that had the passes of strathfillan been defended by two hundred resolute men not only would his progress have been effectually stopped but his army must have been in danger of being totally cut off security however the bane of many a strong country and many a fortress betrayed on this occasion the district of argyle to his enemies the invaders had only to contend with the natural difficulties of the path and with the snow which fortunately had not fallen in any great quantity the army no sooner reached the summit of the ridge of hills dividing argyleshire from the district of breadalbane than they rushed down upon the devoted vales beneath them with a fury sufficiently expressive of the motives which had dictated a movement so difficult and hazardous montrose divided his army into three bodies in order to produce a wider and more extensive terror one of which was commanded by the captain of clan ronald one entrusted to the leading of colkitto and the third remained under his own direction he was thus enabled to penetrate the country of argyle at three different points resistance there was none the flight of the shepherds from the hills had first announced in the peopled districts this formidable eruption and wherever the clansmen were summoned out they were killed disarmed and dispersed by an enemy who had anticipated their motions major dalgetty who had been sent forward against inverary with the few horse of the army that were fit for service managed his matters so well that he had very nearly surprised argyle as he expressed it inter pocula and it was only a rapid flight by water which saved that chief from death or captivity but the punishment which argyle himself escaped fell heavily upon his country and clan and the ravages committed by montrose on that devoted land 
although too consistent with the genius of the country and times have been repeatedly and justly quoted as a blot on his actions and character argyle in the meantime had fled to edinburgh to lay his complaints before the convention of estates to meet the exigence of the moment a considerable army was raised under general bailey a presbyterian officer of skill and fidelity with whom was joined in command the celebrated sir john urey a soldier of fortune like dalgetty who had already changed sides twice during the civil war and was destined to turn his coat a third time before it was ended argyle also burning with indignation proceeded to levy his own numerous forces in order to avenge himself of his feudal enemy he established his headquarters at dunbarton where he was soon joined by a considerable force consisting chiefly of his own clansmen and dependents being there joined by bailey and urey with a very considerable army of regular forces he prepared to march into argyleshire and chastise the invader of his paternal territories but montrose while these two formidable armies were forming a junction had been recalled from that ravaged country by the approach of a third collected in the north under the earl of seaforth who after some hesitation having embraced the side of the covenanters had now with the assistance of the veteran garrison of inverness formed a considerable army with which he threatened montrose from inverness shire enclosed in a wasted and unfriendly country and menaced on each side by advancing enemies of superior force it might have been supposed that montrose's destruction was certain but these were precisely the circumstances under which the active and enterprising genius of the great marquis was calculated to excite the wonder and admiration of his friends the astonishment and terror of his enemies as if by magic he collected his scattered forces from the wasteful occupation in which they had been engaged and scarce were they again united ere argyle and his associate generals were informed that the royalists having suddenly disappeared from argyleshire had retreated northwards among the dusky and impenetrable mountains of lochaber the sagacity of the generals opposed to montrose immediately conjectured that it was the purpose of their active antagonist to fight with and if possible to destroy seaforth ere they could come to his assistance this occasioned a corresponding change in their operations leaving this chieftain to make the best defence he could urey and bailey again separated their forces from those of argyle and having chiefly horse and lowland troops under their command they kept the southern side of the grampian ridge moving along eastward into the county of angus resolving from thence to proceed into aberdeenshire in order to intercept montrose if he should attempt to escape in that direction argyle with his own levies and other troops undertook to follow montrose's march so that in case he should come to action either with seaforth or with bailey and urey he might be placed between two fires by this third army which at a secure distance was to hang upon his rear for this purpose argyle once more moved towards inverary having an opportunity at every step to deplore the severities which the hostile clans had exercised on his dependence and country whatever noble qualities the highlanders possessed and they had many clemency in treating a hostile country was not of the number but even the ravages of hostile troops combined to swell the number of argyle's followers it is still a highland proverb he whose house is burnt must become a soldier and hundreds of the inhabitants of these unfortunate valleys had now no means of maintenance save by exercising upon others the severities they had themselves sustained and no future prospect of happiness excepting in the gratification of revenge his bands were therefore augmented by the very circumstances 
which had desolated his country and argyle soon found himself at the head of three thousand determined men distinguished for activity and courage and commanded by gentlemen of his own name who yielded to none in those qualities under himself he conferred the principal command upon sir duncan campbell of ardenvor and another sir duncan campbell of auchenbreck this last character is historical an experienced and veteran soldier whom he had recalled from the wars of ireland for this purpose the cold spirit of argyle himself however clogged the military councils of his more intrepid assistants and it was resolved notwithstanding their increased force to observe the same plan of operations and to follow montrose cautiously in whatever direction he should march avoiding an engagement until an opportunity should occur of falling upon his rear while he should be engaged with another enemy in front End of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of a legend of montrose this is a librivox recording a librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah a legend of montrose by sir walter scott chapter eighteen piobrock a denul du piobrock al denul piobrock agus se bretoc ficht an interloqui the war tune of donald the black the war tune of black donald the pipes and the banner are up in the rendezvous of inverlochy the military road connecting the chains of forts as it is called and running in the general line of the present caledonian canal has now completely opened the great glen or chasm extending almost across the whole island once doubtless filled by the sea and still affording basins for that long line of lakes by means of which modern art has united the german and atlantic oceans the paths or tracks by which the natives traversed this extensive valley were in sixteen forty five to sixteen forty six in the same situation as when they awaked the strain of an irish engineer officer who had been employed in converting them into practicable military roads and whose eulogium begins and for aught i know ends as follows had you but seen these roads before they were made you would have held up your hands and blessed general wade but bad as the ordinary paths were montrose avoided them and led his army like a herd of wild deer from mountain to mountain and from forest to forest where his enemies could learn nothing of his motions while he acquired the most perfect knowledge respecting theirs from the friendly clans of cameron and macdonnell whose mountainous districts he now traversed strict orders had been given that argyle's advance should be watched and that all intelligence respecting his motions should be communicated instantly to the general himself it was a moonlit night and montrose worn out by the fatigues of the day was laid down to sleep in a miserable sheiling he had only slumbered two hours when some one touched his shoulder he looked up and by the stately form and deep voice easily recognized the chief of the camerons i have news for you said that leader which is worth while to arise and listen to mackledui mcconnell do the descendant of black donald can bring no other said montrose addressing the chief by his patronymic title are they good or bad as you may take them said the chieftain are they certain demanded montrose yes answered mackledui or another messenger should have brought them know that tired with the task imposed upon me of accompanying that unhappy dalgetty and his handful of horse who detained me for hours on the march at the pace of a crippled badger i made a stretch of four miles with six of my people in the direction of inverlochy and there met with ian of glenroy 
who had been out for intelligence argyle is moving upon inverlochy with three thousand chosen men commanded by the flower of the sons of diomed these are my news they are certain it is for you to construe their purport their purport must be good answered montrose readily and cheerfully the voice of mackledui is ever pleasant in the ears of montrose and most pleasant when it speaks of some brave enterprise at hand what are our musters he then called for light and easily ascertained that a great part of his followers having as usual dispersed to secure their booty he had not with him above twelve or fourteen hundred men not much above a third said montrose pausing of argyle's force and highlanders opposed to highlanders with the blessing of god upon the royal cause i would not hesitate were the odds but one to two then do not hesitate said cameron for when your trumpets shall sound to attack macallum more not a man of these glens will remain deaf to the summons glengarry capac i myself would destroy with fire and sword the wretch who should remain behind under any pretence whatsoever to-morrow or the next day shall be a day of battle to all who bear the name of macdonnell or cameron whatever be the event it is gallantly said my noble friend said montrose grasping his hand and i were worse than a coward did i not do justice to such followers by entertaining the most indubitable hopes of success we will turn back on this macallum moore who follows us like a raven to devour the relics of our army should we meet braver men who may be able to break its strength let the chiefs and leaders be called together as quickly as possible and you who have brought us the first news of this joyful event for such it shall be you mackledui shall bring it to a joyful issue by guiding us the best and nearest road against our enemy that will i willingly do said mackledui if i have shown you paths by which to retreat through these dusky wilds with far more readiness will i teach you how to advance against your foe a general bustle now prevailed and the leaders were everywhere startled from the rude couches on which they had sought temporary repose i never thought said major dalgetty when summoned up from a handful of rugged heather roots to have parted from a bed as hard as a stable broom with such bad will but indubitably having but one man of military experience in his army his excellency the marquis may be vindicated in putting him upon hard duty so saying he repaired to the council where notwithstanding his pedantry montrose seemed always to listen to him with considerable attention partly because the major really possessed military knowledge and experience and often made suggestions which were found of advantage and partly because it relieved the general from the necessity of deferring entirely to the opinion of the highland chiefs and gave him additional ground for disputing it when it was not agreeable to his own on the present occasion dalgetty joyfully acquiesced in the proposal of marching back and confronting argyle which he compared to the valiant resolution of the great gustavus who moved against the duke of bavaria and enriched his troops by the plunder of that fertile country although menaced from the northward by the large army which wallenstein had assembled in bohemia the chiefs of glengarry Capic, and lochiel whose clans equal in courage and military fame to any in the highlands lay within the neighborhood of the scene of action dispatched the fiery cross through their vassals to summon every one who could bear arms to meet the king's lieutenant and to join the standards of their respective chiefs as they marched towards inverlochy as the order was emphatically given it was speedily and willingly obeyed their natural love of war their zeal for the royal cause for they viewed the king in the light of a chief whom his clansmen had deserted as well as their implicit obedience to their own patriarch drew into montrose's army not only all in the neighborhood 
who were able to bear arms but some who in age at least might have been esteemed past the use of them during the next day's march which being directed straight through the mountains of lochaber was unsuspected by the enemy his forces were augmented by handfuls of men issuing from each glen and ranging themselves under the banners of their respective chiefs this was a circumstance highly inspiriting to the rest of the army who by the time they approached the enemy found their strength increased considerably more than one-fourth as had been prophesied by the valiant leader of the camerons while montrose executed this countermarch argyle had at the head of his gallant army advanced up the southern side of loch eel and reached the river lochy which combines that lake with loch lochy the ancient castle of inverlochy once as it is said a royal fortress and still although dismantled a place of some strength and consideration offered convenient headquarters and there was ample room for argyle's army to encamp around him in the valley where the lochy joins loch eel several barges had attended loaded with provisions so that they were in every respect as well accommodated as such an army wished or expected to be argyle in council with auchenbreck and ardenvor expressed his full confidence that montrose was now on the brink of destruction that his troops must gradually diminish as he moved eastward through such uncouth paths that if he went westward he must encounter uri and bailey if northward fall into the hands of seaforth or should he choose any halting-place he would expose himself to be attacked by three armies at once i cannot rejoice in the prospect my lord said auchenbreck that james graham will be crushed with little assistance of ours he has left a heavy account in argyleshire against him and i long to reckon with him drop of blood for drop of blood i love not the payment of such debts by third hands you are too scrupulous said argyle what signifies it by whose hands the blood of the grams is spilt it is time that of the sons of diarmid should cease to flow what say you ardenvor i say my lord replied sir duncan that i think auchenbreck will be gratified and will himself have a personal opportunity of settling accounts with montrose for his depredations reports have reached our outposts that the camerons are assembling their full strength on the skirts of ben nevis this must be to join the advance of montrose and not to cover his retreat it must be some scheme of harassing and depredation said argyle devised by the inveterate malignity of mackledui which he terms loyalty they can intend no more than an attack on our outposts or some annoyance to to-morrow's march i have sent out scouts said sir duncan in every direction to procure intelligence and we must soon hear whether they really do assemble any force upon what point or with what purpose it was late ere any tidings were received but when the moon had arisen a considerable bustle in the camp and a noise immediately after heard in the castle announced the arrival of important intelligence of the scouts first dispersed by ardenvor some had returned without being able to collect anything save uncertain rumours concerning movements in the country of the camerons it seemed as if the skirts of ben nevis were sending forth those unaccountable and portentous sounds with which they sometimes announce the near approach of a storm others whose zeal carried them farther upon their mission were entrapped and slain or made prisoners by the inhabitants of the fastnesses into which they endeavoured to penetrate at length on the rapid advance of montrose's army his advanced guard and the outposts of argyle became aware of each other's presence and after exchanging a few musket shots and arrows fell back to their respective main bodies to convey intelligence and receive orders sir duncan campbell and auchenbreck instantly threw themselves on horseback 
in order to visit the state of the outposts and argyle maintained his character of commander-in-chief with reputation by making a respectable arrangement of his forces in the plain as it was evident that they might now expect a night alarm or an attack in the morning at farthest montrose had kept his forces so cautiously within the defiles of the mountain that no effort which auchenbreck or ardenvor thought it prudent to attempt could ascertain his probable strength they were aware however that at the utmost computation it must be inferior to their own and they returned to argyle to inform him of the amount of their observations but that nobleman refused to believe that montrose could be in presence himself he said it was a madness of which even james graham in his height of presumptuous frenzy was incapable and he doubted not that their march was only impeded by their ancient enemies glencoe keppoch and glengarry and perhaps macvory with his macphersons might have assembled a force which he knew must be greatly inferior in numbers to his own and whom therefore he doubted not to disperse by force or by terms of capitulation the spirit of argyle's followers was high breathing vengeance for the disasters which their country had so lately undergone and the night passed in anxious hopes that the morning might dawn upon their vengeance the outposts of either army kept a careful watch and the soldiers of argyle slept in the order of battle which they were next day to occupy a pale dawn had scarce begun to tinge the tops of these immense mountains when the leaders of both armies prepared for the business of the day it was the second of february sixteen forty five to sixteen forty six the clansmen of argyle were arranged in two lines not far from the angle between the river and the lake and made an appearance equally resolute and formidable auchenbreck would willingly have commenced the battle by an attack on the outposts of the enemy but argyle with more cautious policy preferred receiving to making the onset signals were soon heard that they could not long wait for it in vain the campbells could distinguish in the gorge of the mountains the war tunes of various clans as they advanced to the onset that of the camerons which bears the ominous words addressed to the wolves and ravens come to me and i will give you flesh was loudly re-echoed from their native glens in the language of the highland bards the war voice of glengarry was not silent and the gathering tunes of other tribes could be plainly distinguished as they successively came up to the extremity of the passes from which they were to descend into the plain you see said argyle to his kinsman it is as i said we have only to deal with our neighbours james graham has not ventured to show us his banner at this moment there resounded from the gorge of the pass a lively flourish of trumpets in that note with which it was the ancient scottish fashion to salute the royal standard you may hear my lord from yonder signal said sir duncan campbell that he who pretends to be the king's lieutenant must be in person among these men and has probably horse with him said auchenbreck which i could not have anticipated but shall we look pale for that my lord when we have foes to fight and wrongs to revenge argyle was silent and looked upon his arm which hung in a sash owing to a fall which he had sustained in a preceding march it is true interrupted ardenvor eagerly my lord of argyle you are disabled from using either sword or pistol you must retire on board the galleys your life is precious to us as a head your hand cannot be useful to us as a soldier no said argyle pride contending with irresolution it shall never be said that i fled before montrose if i cannot fight i will at least die in the midst of my children several other principal chiefs of the campbells with one voice conjured and obtested their chieftain to leave them for that day to the leading of ardenvor and auchenbreck 
and to behold the conflict from a distance and in safety we dare not stigmatize argyle with poltroonery for though his life was marked by no action of bravery yet he behaved with so much composure and dignity in the final and closing scene that his conduct upon the present and similar occasions should be rather imputed to indecision than to want of courage but when the small still voice within a man's own breast which tells him that his life is of consequence to himself is seconded by that of numbers around him who assure him that it is of equal advantage to the public history affords many examples of men more habitually daring than argyle who have consulted self-preservation when the temptations to it were so powerfully increased see him on board if you will sir duncan said auchenbreck to his kinsman it must be my duty to prevent this spirit from spreading farther among us so saying he threw himself among the ranks entreating commanding and conjuring the soldiers to remember their ancient fame and their present superiority the wrongs they had to revenge if successful and the fate they had to dread if vanquished and imparting to every bosom a portion of the fire which glowed in his own slowly meanwhile and apparently with reluctance argyle suffered himself to be forced by his officious kinsman to the verge of the lake and was transported on board of a galley from the deck of which he surveyed with more safety than credit the scene which ensued sir duncan campbell of ardenvor notwithstanding the urgency of the occasion stood with his eyes riveted on the boat which bore his chieftain from the field of battle there were feelings in his bosom which could not be expressed for the character of a chief was that of a father and the heart of a clansman durst not dwell upon his failings with critical severity as upon those of other men argyle too harsh and severe to others was generous and liberal among his kinsmen and the noble heart of ardenvor was wrung with bitter anguish when he reflected to what interpretation his present conduct might subject him it is better it should be so said he to himself devouring his own emotion but of his line of a hundred sires i know not one who would have retired while the banner of diarmid waved in the wind in the face of its most inveterate foes a loud shout now compelled him to turn and to hasten with all dispatch to his post which was on the right flank of argyle's little army the retreat of argyle had not passed unobserved by his watchful enemy who occupying the superior ground could mark every circumstance which passed below the movement of three or four horsemen to the rear showed that those who retreated were men of rank they are going said dalgetty to put their horses out of danger like prudent cavaliers yonder goes sir duncan campbell riding a brown bay gelding which i had marked for my own second charger you are wrong major said montrose with a bitter smile they are saving their precious chief give the signal for assault instantly send the word through the ranks gentlemen noble chiefs glengarry capic mcvory upon them instantly ride to mcildewey major dalgetty and tell him to charge as he loves lochaber return and bring our handful of horse to my standard they shall be placed with the irish as a reserve End of chapter eighteen Chapter Nineteen of A Legend of Montrose. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. A Legend of Montrose by Sir Walter Scott. Chapter Nineteen. As meets a rock, a thousand waves so innisfail met lochlin ossian the trumpets and bagpipes those clamorous harbingers of blood and death at once united in the signal for onset which was replied to 
by the cry of more than two thousand warriors and the echoes of the mountain glens behind them divided into three bodies or columns the highland followers of montrose poured from the defiles which had hitherto concealed them from their enemies and rushed with the utmost determination upon the campbells who waited their charge with the greatest firmness behind these charging columns marched in line the irish under colkitto intended to form the reserve with them was the royal standard and montrose himself and on the flanks were about fifty horse under dalgetty which by wonderful exertions had been kept in some sort fit for service the right column of royalists was led by glengarry the left by lochiel and the centre by the earl of menteith who preferred fighting on foot in a highland dress to remaining with the cavalry the highlanders poured on with the proverbial fury of their country firing their guns and discharging their arrows at a little distance from the enemy who received the assault with the most determined gallantry better provided with musketry than their enemies stationary also and therefore taking the more decisive aim the fire of argyle's followers was more destructive than that which they sustained the royal clans perceiving this rushed to close quarters and succeeded on two points in throwing their enemies into disorder with regular troops this must have achieved a victory but here highlanders were opposed to highlanders and the nature of the weapons as well as the agility of those who wielded them was equal on both sides their strife was accordingly desperate and the clash of the swords and axes as they encountered each other or rung upon the targets was mingled with the short wild animating shrieks with which highlanders accompany the battle the dance or indeed violent exertion of any kind many of the foes opposed were personally acquainted and sought to match themselves with each other from motives of hatred or a more generous emulation of valor neither party would retreat an inch while the place of those who fell and they fell fast on both sides was eagerly supplied by others who thronged to the front of danger a steam like that which arises from a seething cauldron rose into the thin cold frosty air and hovered above the combatants so stood the fight on the right and the centre with no immediate consequence except mutual wounds and death on the right of the campbells the knight of ardenvor obtained some advantage through his military skill and by strength of numbers he had moved forward obliquely the extreme flank of his line at the instant the royalists were about to close so that they sustained a fire at once on front and in flank and despite the utmost efforts of their leader were thrown into some confusion at this instant sir duncan campbell gave the word to charge and thus unexpectedly made the attack at the very moment he seemed about to receive it such a change of circumstances is always discouraging and often fatal but the disorder was remedied by the advance of the irish reserve whose heavy and sustained fire compelled the knight of ardenvor to forego his advantage and content himself with repulsing the enemy the marquis of montrose in the meanwhile availing himself of some scattered birch trees as well as of the smoke produced by the close fire of the irish musketry which concealed the operation called upon dalgetty to follow him with the horse and wheeling round so as to gain the right flank and even the rear of the enemy he commanded his six trumpets to sound the charge the clang of the cavalry trumpets and the noise of the galloping of the horse produced an effect upon argyle's right wing which no other sounds could have impressed them with 
the mountaineers of that period had a superstitious dread of the war-horse like that entertained by the peruvians and had many strange ideas respecting the manner in which that animal was trained to combat when therefore they found their ranks unexpectedly broken and that the objects of their greatest terror were suddenly in the midst of them the panic in spite of sir duncan's attempts to stop it became universal indeed the figure of major dalgetty alone sheathed in impenetrable armour and making his horse caracole and bound so as to give weight to every blow which he struck would have been a novelty in itself sufficient to terrify those who had never seen anything more nearly resembling such a cavalier than a shelty waddling under a highlander far bigger than itself the repulsed royalists returned to the charge the irish keeping their ranks maintained a fire equally close and destructive there was no sustaining the fight longer argyle's followers began to break and fly most towards the lake the remainder in different directions the defeat of the right wing of itself decisive was rendered irreparable by the death of auchenbreck who fell while endeavouring to restore order the knight of ardenvor with two or three hundred men all gentlemen of descent and distinguished gallantry for the campbells are supposed to have had more gentlemen in their ranks than any of the highland clans endeavoured with unavailing heroism to cover the tumultuary retreat of the common file their resolution only proved fatal to themselves as they were charged again and again by fresh adversaries and forced to separate from each other until at length their aim seemed only to be to purchase an honourable death by resisting to the very last good quarter sir duncan called out major dalgetty when he discovered his late host with one or two others defending himself against several highlanders and to enforce his offer he rode up to him with his sword uplifted sir duncan's reply was the discharge of a reserved pistol which took effect not on the person of the rider but on that of his gallant horse which shot through the heart fell dead under him ronald mackay who was one of those who had been pressing sir duncan hard took the opportunity to cut him down with his broadsword as he turned from him in the act of firing the pistol alan macaulay came up at this moment they were excepting ronald followers of his brother who were engaged on that part of the field villains he said which of you has dared to do this when it was my positive order that the knight of ardenvor should be taken alive half a dozen of busy hands which were emulously employed in plundering the fallen knight whose arms and accoutrements were of a magnificence befitting his quality instantly forbore the occupation and half the number of voices exculpated themselves by laying the blame on the skyman as they called ronald mackay dog of an islander said alan forgetting in his wrath their prophetic brotherhood follow the chase and harm him no farther unless you mean to die by my hand they were at this moment left almost alone for alan's threats had forced his own clan from the spot and all around had pressed onwards toward the lake carrying before them noise terror and confusion and leaving behind only the dead and dying the moment was tempting to mackay's vengeful spirit that i should die by your hand red as it is with the blood of my kindred said he answering the threat of alan in a tone as menacing as his own is not more likely than that you should fall by mine with that he struck at macaulay with such unexpected readiness that he had scarce time to intercept the blow with his target villain said alan in astonishment what means this i am ronald of the mist answered the isleman repeating the blow and with that word they engaged in close and furious conflict 
it seemed to be decreed that in Alan Macaulay had arisen the avenger of his mother's wrongs upon this wild tribe, as was proved by the issue of the present, as well as of former combats. After exchanging a few blows, Ronald Mackay was prostrated by a deep wound on the skull, and Macaulay, setting his foot on him, was about to pass the broadsword through his body when the point of the weapon was struck up by a third party who suddenly interposed. This was no other than Major Dalgetty, who, stunned by the fall and encumbered by the dead body of his horse, had now recovered his legs and his understanding. "'Hold up your sword,' said he to Macaulay, "'and prejudice this person no farther, in respect that he is here in my safe conduct and in his excellency's service and in regard that no honourable cavalier is at liberty by the law martial to avenge his own private injuries flagrante bello multo magus flagrante praelio fool said alan stand aside and dare not to come between the tiger and his prey but far from quitting his point Dalgetty stepped across the fallen body of Mackay, and gave Allan to understand that if he called himself a tiger, he was likely, at present, to find a lion in his path. There required no more than the gesture and tone of defiance to turn the whole rage of the military seer against the person who was opposing the course of his vengeance, and blows were instantly exchanged without farther ceremony. The strife betwixt Allan and Mackay had been unnoticed by the stragglers around, for the person of the latter was known to few of Montrose's followers, but the scuffle betwixt Dalgetty and him, both so well known, attracted instant attention, and fortunately, among others, that of Montrose himself, who had come for the purpose of gathering together his small body of horse, and following the pursuit down Loch Eel aware of the fatal consequences of dissension in his little army he pushed his horse up to the spot and seeing mackay on the ground and dalgetty in the attitude of protecting him against macaulay his quick apprehension instantly caught the cause of quarrel and as instantly devised means to stop it for shame he said gentlemen cavaliers brawling together in so glorious a field of victory are you mad or are you intoxicated with the glory which you have both this day gained it is not my fault so please your excellency said dalgetty i have been known a bonus sacius a bon camarado in all the services of europe but he that touches a man under my safeguard and he said alan speaking at the same time who dares to bar the course of my just vengeance for shame gentlemen again repeated montrose i have other business for you both business of deeper importance than any private quarrel which you may easily find a more fitting time to settle for you major dalgetty kneel down kneel said dalgetty i have not learned to obey that word of command saving when it is given from the pulpit in the Swedish discipline, the front rank do indeed kneel, but only when the regiment is drawn up six file deep. Nevertheless, repeated Montrose, kneel down, in the name of King Charles and of his representative. When Dalgetty reluctantly obeyed, Montrose struck him lightly on the neck with the flat of his sword, saying, in reward of the gallant service of this day and in the name and authority of our sovereign king charles i dub thee knight be brave loyal and fortunate and now sir dugald dalgetty to your duty collect what horsemen you can and pursue such of the enemy as are flying down the side of the lake do not disperse your force nor venture too far but take heed to prevent their rallying which very little exertion may do mount then sir dugald and do your duty but what shall i mount said the new-made chevalier poor gustavus sleeps in the bed of honour like his immortal namesake 
and i am made a knight a rider as the high dutch have it just when i have not a horse left to ride upon in german as in latin the original meaning of the word ritter corresponding to equus is merely a horseman that shall not be said answered montrose dismounting i make you a present of my own which has been thought a good one only i pray you resume the duty you discharge so well with many acknowledgments sir dugald mounted the steed so liberally bestowed upon him and only beseeching his excellency to remember that mackay was under his safe conduct immediately began to execute the orders assigned to him with great zeal and alacrity and you allan macaulay said montrose addressing the highlander who leaning his sword-point on the ground had regarded the ceremony of his antagonist's knighthood with a sneer of sullen scorn you who are superior to the ordinary men led by the paltry motives of plunder and pay and personal distinction you whose deep knowledge renders you so valuable a counsellor is it you whom i find striving with a man like dalgetty for the privilege of trampling the remains of life out of so contemptible an enemy as lies there come my friend i have other work for you this victory skilfully improved shall win seaforth to our party it is not disloyalty but despair of the good cause that has induced him to take arms against us these arms in this moment of better augury he may be brought to unite with ours i shall send my gallant friend colonel hay to him from this very field of battle but he must be united in commission with a highland gentleman of rank befitting that of seaforth and of talents and of influence such as may make an impression upon him you are not only in every respect the fittest for this most important mission but having no immediate command your presence may be more easily spared than that of a chief whose following is in the field you know every pass and glen in the highlands as well as the manners and customs of every tribe go therefore to hay on the right wing he has instructions and expects you you will find him with glen morrison's men be his guide his interpreter and his colleague allan macaulay bent on the marquis a dark and penetrating glance as if to ascertain whether this sudden mission was not conferred for some latent and unexplained purpose but montrose skilful in searching the motives of others was an equal adept in concealing his own he considered it as of the last consequence in this moment of enthusiasm and exalted passion to remove allan from the camp for a few days that he might provide as his honour required for the safety of those who had acted as his guides when he trusted the seer's quarrel with dalgetty might be easily made up allan at parting only recommended to the marquis the care of sir duncan campbell whom montrose instantly directed to be conveyed to a place of safety he took the same precaution for mackay committing the latter however to a party of the irish with directions that he should be taken care of but that no highlander of any clan should have access to him the marquis then mounted a led horse which was held by one of his attendants and rode on to view the scene of his victory which was more decisive than even his ardent hopes had anticipated of argyle's gallant army of three thousand men fully one half fell in the battle or in the flight they had been chiefly driven back upon that part of the plain where the river forms an angle with the lake so that there was no free opening either for retreat or escape several hundreds were forced into the lake and drowned of the survivors about one half escaped by swimming the river or by an early flight along the left bank of the lake the remainder threw themselves into the old castle of inverlochy but being without either provisions or hopes of relief 
they were obliged to surrender on condition of being suffered to return to their homes in peace arms ammunition standards and baggage all became the prey of the conquerors this was the greatest disaster that ever befell the race of diarmid as the campbells were called in the highlands it being generally remarked that they were as fortunate in the issue of their undertakings as they were sagacious in planning and courageous in executing them of the number slain nearly five hundred were dunny vassals or gentlemen claiming descent from known and respected houses and in the opinion of many of the clan even this heavy loss was exceeded by the disgrace arising from the inglorious conduct of their chief whose galley weighed anchor when the day was lost and sailed down the lake with all the speed to which sails and oars could impel her End of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of a legend of montrose this is a librivox recording a librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah a legend of montrose by sir walter scott chapter twenty faint the din of battle braid distant down the hollow wind war and terror fled before wounds and death remained behind penrose montrose's splendid success over his powerful rival was not attained without some loss though not amounting to the tenth of what he inflicted the obstinate valor of the campbells cost the lives of many brave men of the opposite party and more were wounded the chief of whom was the brave young earl of menteith who had commanded the centre he was but slightly touched however and made rather a graceful than a terrible appearance when he presented to his general the standard of argyle which he had taken from the standard-bearer with his own hand and slain him in single combat montrose dearly loved his noble kinsman in whom there was conspicuous a flash of the generous romantic disinterested chivalry of the old heroic times entirely different from the sordid calculating and selfish character which the practice of entertaining mercenary troops had introduced into most parts of europe and of which degeneracy scotland which furnished soldiers a fortune for the service of almost every nation had been contaminated with a more than usual share montrose whose native spirit was congenial although experience had taught him how to avail himself of the motives of others used to menteith neither the language of praise nor of promise but clasped him to his bosom as he exclaimed my gallant kinsman and by this burst of heartfelt applause was menteith thrilled with a warmer glow of delight than if his praises had been recorded in a report of the action sent directly to the throne of his sovereign nothing he said my lord now seems to remain in which i can render any assistance permit me to look after a duty of humanity the knight of ardenvor as i am told is our prisoner and severely wounded and well he deserves to be so said sir dugal dalgetty who came up to them at that moment with a prodigious addition of acquired importance since he shot my good horse at the time that i was offering him honourable quarter which i must needs say was done more like an ignorant highland caterin who has not sense enough to erect a sconce for the protection of his old hurley house of a castle than like a soldier of worth and quality are we to condole with you then said lord menteith upon the loss of the famed gustavus even so my lord answered the soldier with a deep sigh diem closet supremum as we said at the marischal college of aberdeen better so than be smothered like a cager's pony in some flow moss or snow wreath which was like to be his fate if this winter campaign lasted longer 
but it has pleased his excellency making an inclination to montrose to supply his place by the gift of a noble steed whom i have taken the freedom to name loyalty's reward in memory of this celebrated occasion i hope said the marquis you'll find loyalty's reward since you call him so practised in all the duties of the field but i must just hint to you that at this time in scotland loyalty is more frequently rewarded with a halter than with a horse ahem your excellency is pleased to be facetious loyalty's reward is as perfect as gustavus in all his exercises and of a far finer figure Mary, his social qualities are less cultivated in respect he has kept till now inferior company not meaning his excellency the general i hope said lord menteith for shame sir dugald my lord answered the knight gravely i am incapable to mean anything so utterly unbecoming what i asseverate is that his excellency having the same intercourse with his horse during his exercise that he hath with his soldiers when training them may form and break either to every feat of war which he chooses to practise and accordingly that this noble charger is admirably managed but as it is the intercourse of private life that formeth the social character so i do not apprehend that of the single soldier to be much polished by the conversation of the corporal or the sergeant or that of loyalty's reward to have been much dulcified or ameliorated by the society of his excellency's grooms who bestow more oaths and kicks and thumps than kindness or caresses upon the animals entrusted to their charge whereby many a generous quadruped rendered as it were misanthropic manifests during the rest of his life a greater desire to kick and bite his master than to love and to honour him spoken like an oracle said montrose were there an academy for the education of horses to be annexed to the marischal college of aberdeen sir dugald dalgetty alone should fill the chair because being an ass said menteith aside to the general there would be some distant relation between the professor and the students and now with your excellency's permission said the new-made knight i am going to pay my last visit to the remains of my old companion in arms not with the purpose of going through the ceremonial of interment said the marquis who did not know how far sir dugald's enthusiasm might lead him consider our brave fellows themselves will have but a hasty burial your excellency will pardon me said dalgetty my purpose is less romantic i go to divide poor gustavus's legacy with the fowls of heaven leaving the flesh to them and reserving to myself his hide which in token of affectionate remembrance i propose to form into a cassock and trousers after the tartar fashion to be worn under my armour in respect my nether garments are at present shamefully the worse of the wear alas poor gustavus why didst thou not live at least one hour more to have borne the honoured weight of knighthood upon thy loins he was now turning away when the marquis called after him as you are not likely to be anticipated in this act of kindness sir dugald to your old friend and companion i trust said the marquis you will first assist me and our principal friends to discuss some of argyle's good cheer of which we have found abundance in the castle most willingly please your excellency said sir dugald as meat and mass never hinder work nor indeed am i afraid that the wolves or eagles will begin an onslaught on gustavus to-night in regard there is so much better cheer lying all around but added he as i am to meet two honourable knights of england with others of the knightly degree in your lordship's army i pray it may be explained to them that now and in future i claim precedence over them all in respect of my rank as a banneret dubbed in a field of stricken battle 
the devil confound him said montrose speaking aside he has contrived to set the kiln on fire as fast as i could put it out this is a point sir dugald said he gravely addressing him which i shall reserve for his majesty's express consideration in my camp all must be upon equality like the knights of the round table and take their places as soldiers should upon the principle of first come first served then i shall take care said menteith apart to the marquis that don dugald is not first in place to-day sir dugald added he raising his voice as you say your wardrobe is out of repair had you not better go to the enemy's baggage yonder over which there is a guard placed i saw them take out an excellent buff suit embroidered in front in silk and silver voto adios as the spaniard says exclaimed the major and some beggarly gilly may get it while i stand prating here the prospect of booty having at once driven out of his head both gustavus and the provant he set spurs to loyalty's reward and rode off through the field of battle there goes the hound said menteith breaking the face and trampling on the body of many a better man than himself and as eager on his sordid spoil as a vulture that stoops upon carrion yet this man the world calls a soldier and you my lord select him as worthy of the honours of chivalry if such they can at this day be termed you have made the collar of knighthood the decoration of a mere bloodhound what could i do said montrose i had no half-picked bones to give him and bribed in some manner he must be i cannot follow the chase alone besides the dog has good qualities if nature has given him such said menteith habit has converted them into feelings of intense selfishness he may be punctilious concerning his reputation and brave in the execution of his duty but it is only because without these qualities he cannot rise in the service nay his very benevolence is selfish he may defend his companion while he can keep his feet but the instant he is down sir dugald will be as ready to ease him of his purse as he is to convert the skin of gustavus into a buff jerkin and yet if all this were true cousin answered montrose there is something convenient in commanding a soldier upon whose motives and springs of action you can calculate to a mathematical certainty a fine spirit like yours my cousin alive to a thousand sensations to which this man's is as impervious as his corslet it is for such that thy friend must feel while he gives his advice then suddenly changing his tone he asked menteith when he had seen annot lyle the young earl coloured deeply and answered not since last evening excepting he added with hesitation for one moment about half an hour before the battle began my dear menteith said montrose very kindly were you one of the gay cavaliers of whitehall who are in their way as great self-seekers as our friend dalgetty should i need to plague you with inquiring into such an amoret as this it would be an intrigue only to be laughed at but this is the land of enchantment where nets strong as steel are wrought out of ladies tresses and you are exactly the destined knight to be so fettered this poor girl is exquisitely beautiful and has talents formed to captivate your romantic temper you cannot think of injuring her you cannot think of marrying her my lord replied menteith you have repeatedly urged this jest for so i trust it is meant somewhat beyond bounds annot lyle is of unknown birth a captive the daughter probably of some obscure outlaw a dependent on the hospitality of the macaulays do not be angry menteith said the marquis interrupting him you love the classics although not educated at marshall college and you may remember how many gallant hearts captive beauty has subdued 
movet adjacem talamon natum forma captiva dominum tecmase in a word i am seriously anxious about this i should not have time perhaps he added very gravely to trouble you with my lectures on the subject were your feelings and those of annet alone interested but you have a dangerous rival in allan macaulay and there is no knowing to what extent he may carry his resentment it is my duty to tell you that the king's service may be much prejudiced by dissensions betwixt you my lord said menteith i know what you mean is kind and friendly i hope you will be satisfied when i assure you that allan macaulay and i have discussed this circumstance and that i have explained to him that it is utterly remote from my character to entertain dishonourable views concerning this unprotected female so on the other hand the obscurity of her birth prevents my thinking of her upon other terms i will not disguise from your lordship what i have not disguised from macaulay that if annet lyle were born a lady she should share my name and rank as matters stand it is impossible this explanation i trust will satisfy your lordship as it has satisfied a less reasonable person montrose shrugged his shoulders and like true champions in romance he said you have agreed that you are both to worship the same mistress as idolaters do the same image and that neither shall extend his pretensions farther i did not go so far my lord answered menteith i only said in the present circumstances and there is no prospect of their being changed i could in duty to myself and family stand in no relation to annet lyle but as that of friend or brother but your lordship must excuse me i have said he looking at his arm round which he had tied his handkerchief a slight hurt to attend to a wound asked montrose anxiously let me see it alas he said i should have heard nothing of this had i not ventured to tent and sound another more secret and more rankling one menteith i am sorry for you i too have known but what avails it to awake sorrows which have long slumbered so saying he shook hands with his noble kinsman and walked into the castle annet lyle as was not unusual for females in the highlands was possessed of a slight degree of medical and even surgical skill it may readily be believed that the profession of surgery or medicine as a separate art was unknown and the few rude rules which they observed were entrusted to women or to the aged whom constant casualties afforded too much opportunity of acquiring experience the care and attention accordingly of annet lyle her attendants and others acting under her direction had made her services extremely useful during this wild campaign and most readily had these services been rendered to friend and foe wherever they could be most useful she was now in an apartment of the castle anxiously superintending the preparation of vulnerary herbs to be applied to the wounded receiving reports from different females respecting those under their separate charge and distributing what means she had for their relief when allan macaulay suddenly entered the apartment she started for she had heard that he had left the camp upon a distant mission and however accustomed she was to the gloom of his countenance it seemed at present to have even a darker shade than usual he stood before her perfectly silent and she felt the necessity of being the first to speak i thought she said with some effort you had already set out my companion awaits me said allan i go instantly yet still he stood before her and held her by the arm with a pressure which though insufficient to give her pain made her sensible of his great personal strength his hand closing on her like the grip of a manacle shall i take the harp she said in a timid voice is is the shadow falling upon you instead of replying he led her to the window of the apartment 
which commanded a view of the field of the slain with all its horrors it was thick spread with dead and wounded and the spoilers were busy tearing the clothes from the victims of war and feudal ambition with as much indifference as if they had not been of the same species and themselves exposed perhaps to-morrow to the same fate does the sight please you said macaulay it is hideous said annet covering her eyes with her hands how can you bid me look upon it you must be inured to it said he if you remain with this destined host you will soon have to search such a field for my brother's corpse for menteith's for mine but that will be a more indifferent task you do not love me this is the first time you have taxed me with unkindness said annet weeping you are my brother my preserver my protector and can i then but love you but your hour of darkness is approaching let me fetch my harp remain said allan still holding her fast be my visions from heaven or hell or from the middle sphere of disembodied spirits or be they as the saxons hold but the delusions of an overheated fancy they do not now influence me i speak the language of the natural of the visible world you love not me annet you love menteith by him you are beloved again and allan is no more to you than one of the corpses which encumber yonder heath it cannot be supposed that this strange speech conveyed any new information to her who was thus addressed no woman ever lived who could not in the same circumstances have discerned long since the state of her lover's mind but by thus suddenly tearing off the veil thin as it was allan prepared her to expect consequences violent in proportion to the enthusiasm of his character she made an effort to repel the charge he had stated you forget she said your own worth and nobleness when you insult so very helpless a being and one whom fate has thrown so totally into your power you know who and what i am and how impossible it is that menteith or you can use language of affection to me beyond that of friendship you know from what unhappy race i have too probably derived my existence i will not believe it said allan impetuously never flowed crystal drop from a polluted spring yet the very doubt pleaded annet should make you forbear to use this language to me i know said macaulay it places a bar between us but i know also that it divides you not so inseparably from menteith hear me my beloved annet leave this scene of terrors and danger go with me to kintail i will place you in the house of the noble lady of seaforth or you shall be removed in safety to icalmkill where some women yet devote themselves to the worship of god after the custom of our ancestors you consider not what you ask of me replied annet to undertake such a journey under your sole guardianship were to show me less scrupulous than maiden ought i will remain here allan here under the protection of the noble montrose and when his motions next approach the lowlands i will contrive some proper means to relieve you of one who has she knows not how become an object of dislike to you allan stood as if uncertain whether to give way to sympathy with her distress or to anger at her resistance annet he said you know too well how little your words apply to my feelings towards you but you avail yourself of your power and you rejoice in my departure as removing a spy upon your intercourse with menteith but beware both of you he added in a stern tone for when was it ever heard that an injury was offered to allan macaulay for which he exacted not tenfold vengeance so saying he pressed her arm forcibly pulled the bonnet over his brows and strode out of the apartment End of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of a legend of montrose 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. A Legend of Montrose by Sir Walter Scott. Chapter 21. After you're gone, I grew acquainted with my heart, and searched what stirred it so. Alas, I found it love yet far from lust for could i but have lived in presence of you i had had my end philister annet lyle had now to contemplate the terrible gulf which allan macaulay's declaration of love and jealousy had made to open around her it seemed as if she was tottering on the very brink of destruction and was at once deprived of every refuge and of all human assistance she had long been conscious that she loved menteith dearer than a brother indeed how could it be otherwise considering their early intimacy the personal merit of the young nobleman his assiduous attentions and his infinite superiority in gentleness of disposition and grace of manners over the race of rude warriors with whom she lived but her affection was of that quiet timid meditative character which sought rather a reflected share in the happiness of the beloved object than formed more presumptuous or daring hopes a little gaelic song in which she expressed her feelings has been translated by the ingenious and unhappy andrew macdonald and we willingly transcribe the lines wert thou like me in life's low vale with thee how blessed that lot i'd share with thee i'd fly wherever gale would waft or bounding galley bear but parted by severe decree far different must our fortunes prove may thine be joy enough for me to weep and pray for him i love the pangs this foolish heart must feel when hope shall be for ever flown no sullen murmur shall reveal no selfish murmurs ever own nor will i through life's weary years like a pale drooping mourner move while i can think my secret tears may wound the heart of him i love the furious declaration of allan had destroyed the romantic plan which she had formed of nursing in secret her pensive tenderness without seeking any other requital long before this she had dreaded allan as much as gratitude and a sense that he softened towards her a temper so haughty and so violent could permit her to do but now she regarded him with unalloyed terror which a perfect knowledge of his disposition and of his preceding history too well authorized her to entertain whatever was in other respects the nobleness of his disposition he had never been known to resist the wilfulness of passion he walked in the house and in the country of his fathers like a tamed lion whom no one dared to contradict lest they should awaken his natural vehemence of passion so many years had elapsed since he had experienced contradiction or even expostulation that probably nothing but the good strong sense which on all points his mysticism accepted formed the ground of his character prevented his proving an annoyance and terror to the whole neighbourhood but annet had no time to dwell upon her fears being interrupted by the entrance of sir dugald dalgetty it may be well supposed that the scenes in which this person had passed his former life had not much qualified him to shine in female society he himself felt a sort of consciousness that the language of the barrack guard-room and parade was not proper to entertain ladies the only peaceful part of his life had been spent at marischal college aberdeen and he had forgot the little he had learned there except the arts of darning his own hose and dispatching his commons with unusual celerity 
both which had since been kept in good exercise by the necessity of frequent practice still it was from an imperfect recollection of what he had acquired during this pacific period that he drew his sources of conversation when in company with women in other words his language became pedantic when it ceased to be military mistress annot lyle said he upon the present occasion i am just now like the half-pike or pontoon of achilles one end of which could wound and the other cure a property belonging neither to spanish pike brown bill partisan halberd lockaber axe or indeed any other modern staff weapon whatever this compliment he repeated twice but as annet scarce heard him the first time and did not comprehend him the second he was obliged to explain i mean he said mistress annet lyle that having been the means of an honourable knight receiving a severe wound in this day's conflict he having pistolled somewhat against the law of arms my horse which was named after the immortal king of sweden i am desirous of procuring him such solacement as you madam can supply you being like the heathen god esculapius meaning possibly apollo skilful not only in song and in music but in the more noble art of chirurgery opifurcae per orbem decor or if you would have the goodness to explain said annet too sick at heart to be amused by sir dougal's airs of pedantic gallantry that madame replied the knight may not be so easy as i am out of the habit of construing but we shall try decor supply ego i am called opifer opifer i remember signifer and fursifer but i believe opifer stands in this place for m d that is doctor of physic this is a busy day with us all said annet will you say at once what you want with me merely replied sir dugald that you will visit my brother knight and let your maiden bring some medicaments for his wound which threatens to be what the learned call a damnum fatale annet lyle never lingered in the cause of humanity she informed herself hastily of the nature of the injury and interesting herself for the dignified old chief whom she had seen at darlinverach and whose presence had so much struck her she hastened to lose the sense of her own sorrow for a time in the attempt to be useful to another sir dugald with great form ushered annet lyle to the chamber of her patient in which to her surprise she found lord menteith she could not help blushing deeply at the meeting but to hide her confusion proceeded instantly to examine the wound of the knight of ardenvor and easily satisfied herself that it was beyond her skill to cure it as for sir dugald he returned to a large outhouse on the floor of which among other wounded men was deposited the person of ronald of the mist mine old friend said the knight as i told you before i would willingly do anything to pleasure you in return for the wound you have received while under my safe conduct i have therefore according to your earnest request sent mrs annet lyle to attend upon the wound of the knight of ardenvor though wherein her doing so should benefit you i cannot imagine i think you once spoke of some blood relationship between them but a soldado in command and charge like me has other things to trouble his head than with highland genealogies and indeed to do the worthy major justice he never inquired after listened to or recollected the business of other people unless it either related to the art military or was somehow or other connected with his own interest in either of which cases his memory was very tenacious and now my good friend of the mist said he can you tell me what has become of your hopeful grandson as i have not seen him since he assisted me to disarm after the action a negligence which deserveth the strappato he is not far from hence said the wounded outlaw 
lift not your hand upon him for he is man enough to pay a yard of leathern scourge with a foot of tempered steel a most improper vaunt said sir dugald but i owe you some favours ronald and therefore shall let it pass and if you think you owe me anything said the outlaw it is in your power to requite me by granting me a boon friend ronald answered dalgetty i have read of these boons in silly story-books whereby simple knights were drawn into engagements to their great prejudice wherefore ronald the more prudent knights of this day never promise anything until they know that they may keep their word anent the promises without any displeasure or incommodement to themselves it may be you would have me engage the female chirurgian to visit your wound though you ought to consider ronald that the uncleanness of the place where you are deposited may somewhat soil the gaiety of her garments concerning the preservation of which you may have observed women are apt to be inordinately solicitous i lost the favour of the lady of the grand pensionary of amsterdam by touching with the sole of my boot the train of her black velvet gown which i mistook for a footcloth it being half the room distant from her person it is not to bring annet lyle hither answered mackay but to transport me into the room where she is in attendance upon the knight of ardenvor somewhat i have to say of the last consequence to them both it is something out of the order of due precedence said dalgetty to carry a wounded outlaw into the presence of a knight knighthood having been of yore and being in some respects still the highest military grade independent always of commissioned officers who rank according to their patents nevertheless as your boon as you call it is so slight i shall not deny compliance with the same so saying he ordered three files of men to transport mackay on their shoulders to sir duncan campbell's apartment and he himself hastened before to announce the cause of his being brought thither but such was the activity of the soldiers employed that they followed him close at the heels and entering with their ghastly burden laid mackay on the floor of the apartment his features naturally wild were now distorted by pain his hands and scanty garments stained with his own blood and those of others which no kind hand had wiped away although the wound in his side had been secured by a bandage are you he said raising his head painfully towards the couch where lay stretched his late antagonist he whom men call the knight of ardenvor the same answered sir duncan what would you with one whose hours are now numbered my hours are reduced to minutes said the outlaw the more grace if i bestow them in the service of one whose hand has ever been against me as mine has been raised higher against him thine higher against me crushed worm said the knight looking down on his miserable adversary yes answered the outlaw in a firm voice my arm hath been highest in the deadly contest betwixt us the wounds i have dealt have been deepest though thine have neither been idle nor unfelt i am ronald mackay i am ronald of the mist the night that i gave thy castle to the winds in one huge blaze of fire is now matched with the day in which you have fallen under the sword of my fathers remember the injuries thou hast done our tribe never were such inflicted save by one beside thee he they say is fated and secure against our vengeance a short time will show my lord menteith said sir duncan raising himself out of his bed this is a proclaimed villain at once the enemy of king and parliament of god and man one of the outlawed banditti of the mist alike the enemy of your house of the macaulay's and of mine i trust you will not suffer moments which are perhaps my last to be embittered by his barbarous triumph he shall have the treatment he merits said menteith let him be instantly removed 
sir dugald here interposed and spoke of ronald's services as a guide and his own pledge for his safety but the high harsh tones of the outlaw drowned his voice no said he be rack and gibbet the word let me wither between heaven and earth and gorge the hawks and eagles of ben nevis and so shall this haughty knight and this triumphant thane never learn the secret i alone can impart a secret which would make ardenvor's heart leap with joy were he in the death agony and which the earl of menteith would purchase at the price of his broad earldom come hither annot lyle he said raising himself with unexpected strength fear not the sight of him to whom thou hast clung in infancy tell these proud men who disdain thee as the issue of mine ancient race that thou art no blood of ours no daughter of the race of the mist but born in halls as lordly and cradled on couch as soft as ever soothed infancy in their proudest palaces in the name of god said menteith trembling with emotion if you know aught of the birth of this lady do thy conscience the justice to disburden it of the secret before departing from this world and bless my enemies with my dying breath said mackay looking at him malignantly such are the maxims your priests preach but when or towards whom do you practise them let me know first the worth of my secret ere i part with it what would you give knight of ardenvor to know that your superstitious fasts have been in vain and that there still remains a descendant of your house i pause for an answer without it i speak not one word more i could said sir duncan his voice struggling between the emotions of doubt hatred and anxiety i could but that i know thy race are like the great enemy liars and murderers from the beginning but could it be true thou tellest me i could almost forgive thee the injuries thou hast done me hear it said ronald he hath wagered deeply for a son of diarmid and you gentle thane the report of the camp says that you would purchase with life and lands the tidings that annot lyle was no daughter of proscription but of a race noble in your estimation as your own well it is for no love i tell you the time has been that i would have exchanged this secret against liberty i am now bartering it for what is dearer than liberty or life annot lyle is the youngest the sole surviving child of the knight of ardenvor who alone was saved when all in his halls besides was given to blood and ashes can this man speak truth said annot lyle scarcely knowing what she said or is this some strange delusion maiden replied ronald hast thou dwelt longer with us thou wouldst have better learnt to know how to distinguish the accents of truth to that saxon lord and to the knight of ardenvor i will yield such proofs of what i have spoken that incredulity shall stand convinced meantime withdraw i loved thine infancy i hate not thy youth no eye hates the rose in its blossom though it groweth upon a thorn and for thee only do i something regret what is soon to follow but he that would avenge him of his foe must not wreck though the guiltless be engaged in the ruin he advises well annot said lord menteith in god's name retire if if there be aught in this your meeting with sir duncan must be more prepared for both your sakes i will not part from my father if i have found one said annot i will not part from him under circumstances so terrible and a father you shall ever find in me murmured sir duncan then said menteith i will have mackay removed into an adjacent apartment and will collect the evidence of his tale myself sir dugald dalgetty will give me his attendance and assistance with pleasure my lord answered sir dugald i will be your confessor or assessor either or both no one can be so fit 
for i had heard the whole story a month ago at inverary castle but onslaughts like that of ardenvor confuse each other in my memory which is besides occupied with matters of more importance upon hearing this frank declaration which was made as they left the apartment with the wounded man lord menteith darted upon dalgetty a look of extreme anger and disdain to which the self-conceit of the worthy commander rendered him totally insensible End of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of a legend of montrose this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah a legend of montrose by sir walter scott chapter twenty two i am as free as nature first made man ere the base laws of servitude began when wild in woods the noble savage ran conquest of granada the earl of menteith as he had undertaken so he proceeded to investigate more closely the story told by ronald of the mist which was corroborated by the examination of his two followers who had assisted in the capacity of guides these declarations he carefully compared with the circumstances concerning the destruction of his castle and family as sir duncan campbell was able to supply and it may be supposed he had forgotten nothing relating to an event of such terrific importance it was of the last consequence to prove that this was no invention of the outlaws for the purpose of passing an impostor as the child and heiress of ardenvor perhaps menteith so much interested in believing the tale was not altogether the fittest person to be entrusted with the investigation of its truth but the examinations of the children of the mist were simple accurate and in all respects consistent with each other a personal mark was referred to which was known to have been borne by the infant child of sir duncan and which appeared upon the left shoulder of annot lyle it was also well remembered that when the miserable relics of the other children had been collected those of the infant had nowhere been found other circumstances of evidence which it is unnecessary to quote brought the fullest conviction not only to menteith but to the unprejudiced mind of montrose that in annot lyle an humble dependent distinguished only by beauty and talent they were in future to respect the heiress of ardenvor while menteith hastened to communicate the result of these enquiries to the persons most interested the outlaw demanded to speak with his grandchild whom he usually called his son he would be found he said in the outer apartment in which he himself had been originally deposited accordingly the young savage after a close search was found lurking in a corner coiled up among some rotten straw and brought to his grandsire kenneth said the old outlaw hear the last words of the sire of thy father a saxon soldier and allen of the red hand left this camp within these few hours to travel to the country to caberfay pursue them as the bloodhound pursues the hurt deer swim the lake climb the mountain thread the forest tarry not till you join them and then the countenance of the lad darkened as his grandfather spoke and he laid his hand upon a knife which stuck in the thong of leather that confined his scanty plaid no said the old man it is not by thy hand he must fall they will ask the news from the camp say to them that annot lyle of the harp is discovered to be the daughter of duncan of ardenvor that the thane of menteith is to wed her before the priest and that you are sent to bid guests to the bridal tarry not their answer but vanish like the lightning when the black cloud swallows it and now depart beloved son of my best beloved i shall never more see thy face nor hear the light sound of thy footstep 
yet tarry an instant and hear my last charge remember the fate of our race and quit not the ancient manners of the children of the mist we are now a straggling handful driven from every vale by the sword of every clan who rule in the possessions where their forefathers hewed the wood and drew the water for ours but in the thicket of the wilderness and in the midst of the mountain kenneth son of erect keep thou unsoiled the freedom which i leave thee as a birthright barter it not neither for the rich garment nor for the stone roof nor for the covered board nor for the couch of down on the rock or in the valley in abundance or in famine in the leafy summer and in the days of the iron winter son of the mist be free as thy forefathers own no lord receive no law take no hire give no stipend build no hut enclose no pasture sow no grain let the deer of the mountain be thy flocks and herds if these fail thee prey upon the goods of our oppressors of the saxons and of such gale as are saxons in their souls valuing herd and flocks more than honour and freedom well for us that they do so it affords the broader scope for our revenge remember those who have done kindness to our race and pay their services with thy blood should the hour require it if a maclan shall come to thee with the head of the king's son in his hand shelter him though the avenging army of the father were behind him for in glencoe and ardna merchant we have dwelt in peace in the years that have gone by the sons of diarmid the race of darnlinvarach the riders of menteith my curse on thy head child of the mist if thou spare one of those names when the time shall offer for cutting them off and it will come anon for their own swords shall devour each other and those who are scattered shall fly to the mist and perish by its children once more be gone shake the dust from thy feet against the habitations of men whether banded together for peace or for war farewell beloved and mayest thou die like thy forefathers ere infirmity disease or age shall break thy spirit be gone be gone live free requite kindness avenge the injuries of thy race the young savage stooped and kissed the brow of his dying parent but accustomed from infancy to suppress every exterior sign of emotion he parted without tear or adieu and was soon far beyond the limits of montrose's camp sir dugald dalgetty who was present during the latter part of this scene was very little edified by the conduct of mackay upon the occasion i cannot think my friend ronald said he that you are in the best possible road for a dying man storms onslaughts massacres the burning of suburbs are indeed a soldier's daily work and are justified by the necessity of the case seeing that they are done in the course of duty for burning of suburbs in particular it may be said that they are traitors and cutthroats to all fortified towns hence it is plain that a soldier is a profession peculiarly favored by heaven seeing that we may hope for salvation although we daily commit actions of so great violence but then ronald in all services of europe it is the custom of the dying soldier not to vaunt him of such doings or to recommend them to his fellows but on the contrary to express contrition for the same and to repeat or have repeated to him some comfortable prayer which if you please i will intercede with his excellency's chaplain to prefer on your account it is otherwise no point of my duty to put you in mind of those things only it may be for the ease of your conscience to depart more like a christian and less like a turk than you seem to be in a fair way of doing the only answer of the dying man for as such ronald mackay might now be considered was a request to be raised to such a position that he might obtain a view from the window of the castle 
the deep frost mist which had long settled upon the top of the mountains was now rolling down each rugged glen and gully where the craggy ridges showed their black and irregular outline like desert islands rising above the ocean of vapour spirit of the mist said ronald mackay called by our race our father and our preserver receive into thy tabernacle of clouds when this pang is over him whom in life thou hast so often sheltered so saying he sunk back into the arms of those who upheld him spoke no further word but turned his face to the wall for a short space i believe said dalgetty my friend ronald will be found in his heart to be little better than a heathen and he renewed his proposal to procure him the assistance of dr wishart montrose's military chaplain a man said sir dugald very clever in his exercise and who will do execution on your sins in less time than i could smoke a pipe of tobacco saxon said the dying man speak to me no more of thy priest i die contented hadst thou ever an enemy against whom weapons were of no avail whom the ball missed and against whom the arrow shivered and whose bare skin was as impenetrable to sword and dirk as thy still garment heardst thou ever of such a foe very frequently when i served in germany replied sir dugald there was such a fellow at ingolstadt he was proof both against lead and steel the soldiers killed him with the butts of their muskets this impassable foe said ronald without regarding the major's interruption who has the blood dearest to me upon his hands to this man i have now bequeathed agony of mind jealousy despair and sudden death or a life more miserable than death itself such shall be the lot of allan of the red hand when he learns that annet weds menteith and i ask no more than the certainty that it is so to sweeten my own bloody end by his hand if that be the case said the major there's no more to be said but i shall take care as few people see you as possible for i cannot think your mode of departure can be at all creditable or exemplary to a christian army so saying he left the apartment and the son of the mist soon after breathed his last menteith in the meanwhile leaving the new-found relations to their mutual feelings of mingled emotion was eagerly discussing with montrose the consequences of this discovery i should now see said the marquis even had i not before observed it that your interest in this discovery my dear menteith has no small reference to your own happiness you love this new-found lady your affection is returned in point of birth no exceptions can be made in every other respect her advantages are equal to those which you yourself possess think however a moment sir duncan is a fanatic presbyterian at least in arms against the king he is only with us in the quality of a prisoner and we are i fear but at the commencement of a long civil war is this a time think you menteith for you to make proposals for his heiress or what chance is there he will now listen to it passion an ingenious as well as an eloquent advocate supplied the young nobleman with a thousand answers to these objections he reminded montrose that the knight of ardenvor was neither a bigot in politics nor religion he urged his own known and proved zeal for the royal cause and hinted that its influence might be extended and strengthened by his wedding the heiress of ardenvor he pleaded the dangerous state of sir duncan's wound the risk which must be run by suffering the young lady to be carried into the country of the campbells where in case of her father's death or continued indisposition she must necessarily be placed under the guardianship of argyle an event fatal to his menteith's hopes unless he could stoop to purchase his favour by abandoning the king's party 
montrose allowed the force of these arguments and owned although the matter was attended with difficulty yet it seemed consistent with the king's service that it should be concluded as speedily as possible i could wish said he that it were all settled in one way or another and that this fair brisses were removed from our camp before the return of our highland achilles allan macaulay i fear some fatal feud in that quarter menteith and i believe it would be best that sir duncan be dismissed on his parole and that you accompany him and his daughter as his escort the journey can be made chiefly by water so will not greatly incommode his wound and your own my friend will be an honourable excuse for the absence of some time from my camp never said menteith were i to forfeit the very hope that has so lately dawned upon me never will i leave your excellency's camp while the royal standard is displayed i should deserve that this trifling scratch should gangrene and consume my sword-arm were i capable of holding it as an excuse for absence at this crisis of the king's affairs on this then you are determined said montrose as fixed as ben nevis said the young nobleman you must then said montrose lose no time in seeking an explanation with the knight of ardenvor if this prove favourable i will talk myself with the elder macaulay and we will devise means to employ his brother at a distance from the army until he shall be reconciled to his present disappointment would to god some vision would descend upon his imagination fair enough to obliterate all traces of annot lyle that perhaps you think impossible menteith well each to his service you to that of cupid and i to that of mars they parted and in pursuance of the scheme arranged menteith early on the ensuing morning sought a private interview with the wounded knight of ardenvor and communicated to him his suit for the hand of his daughter of their mutual attachment sir duncan was aware but he was not prepared for so early a declaration on the part of menteith he said at first that he had already perhaps indulged too much in feelings of personal happiness at a time when his clan had sustained so great a loss and humiliation and that he was unwilling therefore farther to consider the advancement of his own house at a period so calamitous on the more urgent suit of the noble lover he requested a few hours to deliberate and consult with his daughter upon a question so highly important the result of this interview and deliberation was favourable to menteith sir duncan campbell became fully sensible that the happiness of his new-found daughter depended upon a union with her lover and unless such were now formed he saw that argyle would throw a thousand obstacles in the way of a match in every respect acceptable to himself menteith's private character was so excellent and such was the rank and consideration due to his fortune and family that they outbalanced in sir duncan's opinion the difference in their political opinions nor could he have resolved perhaps had his own opinion of the match been less favourable to decline an opportunity of indulging the new-found child of his hopes there was besides a feeling of pride which dictated his determination to produce the heiress of ardenvor to the world as one who had been educated a poor dependent and musician in the family of darnlinvarach had something in it that was humiliating to introduce her as the betrothed bride or wedded wife of the earl of menteith upon an attachment formed during her obscurity was a warrant to the world that she had at all times been worthy of the rank to which she was elevated it was under the influence of these considerations that sir duncan campbell announced to the lovers his consent that they should be married in the chapel of the castle by montrose's chaplain and as privately as possible but when montrose should break up from inverlochy for which orders were expected in the course of a very few days it was agreed that the young countess should depart with her father to his castle 
and remain there until the circumstances of the nation permitted menteith to retire with honor from his present military employment his resolution being once taken sir duncan campbell would not permit the maidenly scruples of his daughter to delay its execution and it was therefore resolved that the bridal should take place the next evening being the second after the battle End of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of a legend of montrose this is a librivox recording a librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah a legend of montrose by sir walter scott chapter twenty three my maid my blue-eyed maid he bore away due to the toils of many a bloody day iliad it was necessary for many reasons that angus macaulay so long the kind protector of annot lyle should be made acquainted with the change in the fortunes of his late protege and montrose as he had undertaken communicated to him these remarkable events with the careless and cheerful indifference of his character he expressed much more joy than wonder at annot's good fortune had no doubt whatever she would merit it and as she had always been bred in loyal principles would convey the whole estate of her grim fanatical father to some honest fellow who loved the king i should have no objection that my brother allan should try his chance added he notwithstanding that sir duncan campbell was the only man who ever charged darnlinvarach with inhospitality annot lyle could always charm allan out of the sullens and who knows whether matrimony might not make him more of a man of this world montrose hastened to interrupt the progress of his castle building by informing him that the lady was already wooed and won and with her father's approbation was almost immediately to be wedded to his kinsman the earl of menteith and that in testimony of the high respect due to macaulay so long the lady's protector he was now to request his presence at the ceremony macaulay looked very grave at this intimation and drew up his person with the air of one who thought that he had been neglected he contrived he said that his uniform kind treatment of the young lady while so many years under his roof required something more upon such an occasion than a bare compliment of ceremony he might he thought without arrogance have expected to have been consulted he wished his kinsman of menteith well no man could wish him better but he must say he thought he had been hasty in this matter allan's sentiments toward the young lady had been pretty well understood and he for one could not see why the superior pretensions which he had upon her gratitude should have been set aside without at least undergoing some previous discussion montrose seeing too well where all this pointed entreated macaulay to be reasonable and to consider what probability there was that the knight of ardenvor could be brought to confer the hand of his sole heiress upon allan whose undeniable excellent qualities were mingled with others by which they were overclouded in a manner that made all tremble who approached him my lord said angus macaulay my brother allan has as god made us all faults as well as merits but he is the best and bravest man of your army be the other who he may and therefore ill deserved that his happiness should have been so little consulted by your excellency by his own near kinsman and by a young person who owes all to him and to his family montrose in vain endeavoured to place the subject in a different view this was the point in which angus was determined to regard it and he was a man of that calibre of understanding 
who is incapable of being convinced when he has once adopted a prejudice montrose now assumed a higher tone and called upon angus to take care how he nourished any sentiments which might be prejudicial to his majesty's service he pointed out to him that he was peculiarly desirous that allan's efforts should not be interrupted in the course of his present mission a mission he said highly honourable for himself and likely to prove most advantageous to the king's cause he expected his brother would hold no communication with him upon other subjects nor stir up any cause of dissension which might divert his mind from a matter of such importance angus answered somewhat sulkily that he was no machabate or stirrer up of quarrels he would rather be a peacemaker his brother knew as well as most men how to resent his own quarrels as for allan's mode of receiving information it was generally believed he had other sources than those of ordinary couriers he should not be surprised if they saw him sooner than they expected a promise that he would not interfere was the farthest to which montrose could bring this man thoroughly good-tempered as he was on all occasions save when his pride interest or prejudices were interfered with and at this point the marquis was fain to leave the matter for the present a more willing guest at the bridal ceremony certainly a more willing attendant at the marriage feast was to be expected in sir dugald dalgetty whom montrose resolved to invite as having been a confidant to the circumstances which preceded it but even sir dugald hesitated looked on the elbows of his doublet and the knees of his leather breeches and mumbled out a sort of reluctant acquiescence in the invitation providing he should find it possible after consulting with the noble bridegroom montrose was somewhat surprised but scorning to testify displeasure he left sir dugald to pursue his own course this carried him instantly to the chamber of the bridegroom who amidst the scanty wardrobe which his camp equipage afforded was seeking for such articles as might appear to the best advantage upon the approaching occasion sir dugald entered and paid his compliments and with a very grave face upon his approaching happiness which he said he was very sorry he was prevented from witnessing in plain truth said he i should but disgrace the ceremony seeing that i lack a bridal garment rents and open seams and tatters at elbows in the apparel of the assistants might presage a similar solution of continuity in your matrimonial happiness and to say truth my lord you yourself must partly have the blame of this disappointment in respect you sent me upon a fool's errand to get a buff coat out of the booty taken by the camerons whereas you might as well have sent me to fetch a pound of fresh butter out of a black dog's throat i had no answer my lord but brandished dirks and broadswords and a sort of growling and jabbering in what they call their language for my part i believe these highlanders to be no better than absolute pagans and have been much scandalized by the manner in which my acquaintance ronald mackay was pleased to beat his final march a little while since in menteith's state of mind disposed to be pleased with everything and everybody the grave complaint of sir dugald furnished additional amusement he requested his acceptance of a very handsome buff dress which was lying on the floor i had intended it he said for my own bridal garment as being the least formidable of my warlike equipments and i have here no peaceful dress sir dugald made the necessary apologies would not by any means deprive and so forth until it happily occurred to him that it was much more according to military rule that the earl should be married in his back and breast pieces which dress he had seen the bridegroom wear at the union of prince leo of Wittelsbach with the youngest daughter of old george frederick of saxony under the auspices of the gallant gustavus adolphus the lion of the north 
and so forth the good-natured young earl laughed and acquiesced and thus having secured at least one merry face at his bridal he put on a light and ornamented cuirass concealed partly by a velvet coat and partly by a broad blue silk scarf which he wore over his shoulder agreeably to his rank and the fashion of the times everything was now arranged and it had been settled that according to the custom of the country the bride and bridegroom should not again meet until they were before the altar the hour had already struck that summoned the bridegroom thither and he only waited in a small ante-room adjacent to the chapel for the marquis who condescended to act as bride's man upon the occasion business relating to the army having suddenly required the marquis's instant attention menteith waited his return it may be supposed in some impatience and when he heard the door of the apartment open he said laughing you are late upon parade you will find i am too early said allan macaulay who burst into the apartment draw menteith and defend yourself like a man or die like a dog you are mad allan answered menteith astonished alike at his sudden appearance and at the unutterable fury of his demeanour his cheeks were livid his eyes started from their sockets his lips were covered with foam and his gestures were those of a demoniac you lie traitor was his frantic reply you lie in that as you lie in all you have said to me your life is a lie did i not speak my thoughts when i called you mad said menteith indignantly your own life were a brief one in what do you charge me with deceiving you you told me answered macaulay that you would not marry annet lyle false traitor she now waits you at the altar it is you who speak false retorted menteith i told you the obscurity of her birth was the only bar to our union that is now removed and whom do you think yourself that i should yield up my pretensions in your favour draw then said macaulay we understand each other not now said menteith and not here allan you know me well wait till to-morrow and you shall have fighting enough this hour this instant or never answered macaulay your triumph shall not go farther than the hour which is stricken menteith i entreat you by our relationship by our joint conflicts and labours draw your sword and defend your life as he spoke he seized the earl's hand and wrung it with such frantic earnestness that his grasp forced the blood to start under the nails menteith threw him off with violence exclaiming be gone madman then be the vision accomplished said allan and drawing his dirk struck with his whole gigantic force at the earl's bosom the temper of the corslet threw the point of the weapon upwards but a deep wound took place between the neck and shoulder and the force of the blow prostrated the bridegroom on the floor montrose entered at one side of the ante-room the bridal company alarmed at the noise were in equal apprehension and surprise but ere montrose could almost see what had happened allan macaulay had rushed past him and descended the castle stairs like lightning guards shut the gate exclaimed montrose seize him kill him if he resists he shall die if he were my brother but allan prostrated with a second blow of his dagger a sentinel who was upon duty traversed the camp like a mountain deer though pursued by all who caught the alarm threw himself into the river and swimming to the opposite side was soon lost among the woods in the course of the same evening his brother angus and his followers left montrose's camp and taking the road homeward never again rejoined him of allan himself it is said that in a wonderfully short space after the deed was committed he burst into a room in the castle of inverary where argyle was sitting in council and flung on the table his bloody dirk is it the blood of james graham said argyle a ghastly expression of hope mixing 
with the terror which the sudden apparition naturally excited it is the blood of his minion answered macaulay it is the blood which i was predestined to shed though i would rather have spilt my own having thus spoken he turned and left the castle and from that moment nothing certain is known of his fate as the boy kenneth with three of the children of the mist were seen soon afterwards to cross loch fine it is supposed they dogged his course and that he perished by their hand in some obscure wilderness another opinion maintains that alan macaulay went abroad and died a monk of the carthusian order but nothing beyond bare presumption could ever be brought in support of either opinion his vengeance was much less complete than he probably fancied for menteith though so severely wounded as to remain long in a dangerous state was by having adopted major dalgetty's fortunate recommendation of a cuirass as a bridal garment happily secured from the worst consequences of the blow but his services were lost to montrose and it was thought best that he should be conveyed with his intended countess now truly a mourning bride and should accompany his wounded father-in-law to the castle of sir duncan at ardenvor dalgetty followed them to the water's edge reminding menteith of the necessity of erecting a sconce on drumsnab to cover his lady's newly acquired inheritance they performed their voyage in safety and menteith was in a few weeks so well in health as to be united to annet in the castle of her father the highlanders were somewhat puzzled to reconcile menteith's recovery with the visions of the second sight and the more experienced seers were displeased with him for not having died but others thought the credit of the vision sufficiently fulfilled by the wound inflicted by the hand and with the weapon foretold and all were of opinion that the incident of the ring with the death's head related to the death of the bride's father who did not survive her marriage many months the incredulous held that all this was idle dreaming and that alan's supposed vision was but a consequence of the private suggestions of his own passion which having long seen in menteith a rival more beloved than himself struggled with his better nature and impressed upon him as it were involuntarily the idea of killing his competitor menteith did not recover sufficiently to join montrose during his brief and glorious career and when that heroic general disbanded his army and retired from scotland menteith resolved to adopt the life of privacy which he led till the restoration after that happy event he occupied a situation in the land befitting his rank lived long happy alike in public regard and in domestic affection and died at a good old age our dramatis personae have been so limited that excepting montrose whose exploits and fate are the theme of history we have only to mention sir dugald dalgetty this gentleman continued with the most rigorous punctuality to discharge his duty and to receive his pay until he was made prisoner among others upon the field of philippa he was condemned to share the fate of his fellow-officers upon that occasion who were doomed to death rather by denunciations from the pulpit than the sentence either of civil or military tribunal their blood being considered as a sort of sin-offering to take away the guilt of the land and the fate imposed upon the canaanites under a special dispensation being impiously and cruelly applied to them several lowland officers in the service of the covenanters interceded for dalgetty on this occasion representing him as a person whose skill would be useful in their army and who would be readily induced to change his service but on this point they found sir dugald unexpectedly obstinate he had engaged with the king for a certain term and till that was expired his principles would not permit any shadow of changing the covenanters again understood no such nice distinction 
and he was in the utmost danger of falling a martyr, not to this or that political principle, but merely to his own strict ideas of a military enlistment. Fortunately, his friends discovered by computation that there remained but a fortnight to elapse of the engagement he had formed, and to which, though certain it was never to be renewed, no power on earth could make him false. With some difficulty they procured a reprieve for this short space, after which they found him perfectly willing to come under any engagements they chose to dictate. He entered the service of the estates accordingly, and wrought himself forward to be major in Gilbert Kerr's corps, commonly called the Kirk's own regiment of horse. Of his farther history we know nothing, until we find him in possession of his paternal estate of Drumthwacket, which he acquired not by the sword, but by a pacific intermarriage with Hannah Strachan, a matron somewhat stricken in years, the widow of the Aberdeenshire Covenanter. Sir Dugald is supposed to have survived the revolution, as traditions of no very distant date represent him, as cruising about in that country, very old, very deaf, and very full of interminable stories about the immortal Gustavus Adolphus, the Lion of the North, and the Bulwark of the Protestant Faith. Reader, the tales of my landlord are now finally closed. Closed, and it was my purpose to have addressed thee in the vein of Jedediah Cleechbotham. But like Horam, the son of Asmar, and all other imaginary storytellers, Jedediah has melted into thin air. Mr. Cleechbotham bore the same resemblance to Ariel, as he at whose voice he rose doth to the sage Prospero, and yet so fond are we of the fictions of our own fancy that I part with him and all his imaginary localities with idle reluctance. I am aware this is a feeling in which the reader will little sympathize, but he cannot be more sensible than I am that sufficient varieties have now been exhibited of the Scottish character to exhaust one individual's powers of observation, and that to persist would be useless and tedious. I have the vanity to suppose that the popularity of these novels has shown my countrymen and their peculiarities in lights which were new to the southern reader, and that many, hitherto indifferent upon the subject, have been induced to read Scottish history from the allusions to it in these works of fiction. I retire from the field, conscious that there remains behind not only a large harvest, but laborers capable of gathering it in. More than one writer has of late displayed talents of this description, and if the present author, himself a phantom, may be permitted to distinguish a brother, or perhaps a sister shadow, he would mention, in particular, the author of the very lively work entitled Marriage. End of chapter 23《A Legend of Montrose》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. A Legend of Montrose by Sir Walter Scott. Appendix Number One. The scarcity of my late friend's poem may be an excuse for adding the spirited conclusion of Clan Alpin's vow. The clan Gregor has met in the ancient church of Balquitter. The head of Drummond Ernock is placed on the altar, covered for a time with the banner of the tribe. The chief of the tribe advances to the altar, and pausing on the banner gazed, then cried in scorn his finger raised. This was the boon of Scotland's king, and with a quick and angry fling, tossing the pageant screen away, the dead man's head before him lay. Unmoved he scanned the visage o'er, the clotted locks were dark with gore. The features with convulsions grim, the eyes contorted, sunk and dim. But unappalled in angry mood, with lowering brow, 
unmoved he stood upon the head his bared right hand he laid the other grasped his brand then kneeling cried to heaven i swear this deed of death i own and share as truly fully mine as though this my right hand had dealt the blow come then our foemen one come all if to revenge this caitiff's fall one blade is bared one bow is drawn mine everlasting peace i pawn to claim from them or claim from him in retribution limb for limb in sudden fray or open strife this steel shall render life for life he ceased and at his beckoning nod the clansmen to the altar trod and not a whisper breathed around and not was heard of mortal sound save from the clanking arms they bore that rattled on the marble floor and each as he approached in haste upon the scalp his right hand placed with livid lip and gathered brow each uttered in his turn the vow fierce macalm watched the passing scene and searched them through with glances keen then dashed a tear-drop from his eye unhid it came he knew not why exulting high he towering stood kinsman he cried of alpin's blood and worthy of clan alpin's name unstained by cowardice and shame even do spare not in time of ill shall be clan alpin's legend still end of appendix one appendix number two of a legend of montrose this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah a legend of montrose by sir walter scott appendix number two it has been disputed whether the children of the mist were actual macgregors or whether they were not outlaws named macdonald belonging to ardnamurchan the following act of the privy council seems to decide the question edinburgh fourth february fifteen eighty nine the same day the lords of secret council being credibly informed of ye cruel and mischievous proceeding of ye wicked clan grigor so long continued in blood slaughters herships manifest rifts and stouts committed upon his highnesses peaceable and good subjects inhabiting ye countries ye west ye braes of ye highlands their money years by gone by but specially ere after ye cruel murder of uncle joe drummond of drummany rich his majesty's proper tenant and one of his fosters of glenartney committed upon ye day of last bypast be certain of ye said clan be ye counsel and determination of ye hail a vow to defend ye authors rough whatever yald pursue for revenge of ye same col ye said joe was occupied in seeking of venison to his highness at command of pat lord drummond steward of stratharm and principal forester of glenartney the queen his majesty's dearest spouse being yon shortly looked for to arrive in this realm like as after ye murder committed ye authors rough cutted off ye said uncle joe drummond's head and carried the same to the laird of macgregor who and the hale surname of macgregor's purposely convened upon the sunday rafter at the kirk of bookwitter yer they caused ye said uncle john's head to be print to him and ye avowing ye said murder to have been committed by your communion counsel and determination laid your hands upon the pow and in ethnic and barbarous manner swear to defend ye authors of ye said murder in most proud contempt of our sovereign lord and his authority and in evil example to others wicked limerous to do ye like give ye sal be suffered to remain unpunished then follows a commission to the earls of huntley argyle athole montrose pat lord drummond 
Jaw Commendator of Inchifray, and Campbell of Loch Innell, Duncan Campbell of Ardkinglass, Loch Lane Mackintosh of Dun Octane, Sir Joe Murray of Tillibarden, Knight George Buchanan of that ilk, and Macfarlane of Aracocher, to search for and apprehend Alistair MacGregor of Glenstray, and a number of others nominatum and all others of the said clan grigor or ye assisters capable of the said odious murther or of theft reset of theft herships and sornings quiver they may be apprehended and if they refuse to be taken or flees to strength and houses to pursue and assedge them with fire and sword and this commission to endure for the space of three years such was the system of police in fifteen eighty nine and such the state of scotland nearly thirty years after the reformation end of appendix two notes of a legend of montrose this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. A Legend of Montrose by Sir Walter Scott. Note 1. Fetus et Fiducia sunt relativa. The military men of the times agreed upon dependencies of honor, as they called them, with all the metaphysical argumentation of civilians or school divines the english officer to whom sir james turner was prisoner after the rout at utoxeter demanded his parole of honour not to go beyond the wall of hull without liberty he brought me the message himself i told him i was ready to do so provided he removed his guards from me for fidus et fiducia sunt relativa and if he took my word for my fidelity he was obliged to trust it otherwise it was needless for him to seek it either to give trust to my word which i would not break or his own guards who i supposed would not deceive him in this manner i dealt with him because i knew him to be a scholar turner's memoirs page eighty the english officer allowed the strength of the reasoning but that concise reasoner cromwell soon put an end to the dilemma sir james turner must give his parole or be laid in irons end of note one note two wraths a species of apparition similar to what the germans call a double ganger was believed in by the celtic tribes and is still considered as an emblem of misfortune or death mr kirk see note to rob roy the minister of aberfoyle who will no doubt be able to tell us more of the matter should he ever come back from fairyland gives us the following some men of that exalted sight either by art or nature have told me that they have seen at these meetings a double man or the shape of some man in two places that is a superterranean and a subterranean inhabitant perfectly resembling one another in all points whom he notwithstanding could easily distinguish one from the other by some secret tokens and operations and so go speak to the man his neighbour and familiar passing by the apparition or resemblance of him they avouch that every element and different state of being have animals resembling those of another element as there be fishes at sea resembling monks of late order in all their hoods and dresses so as the roman invention of good and bad demons and guardian angels particularly assigned is called by them one ignorant mistake springing only from this original they call this reflex man a co-walker every way like the man as a twin brother and companion haunting him as his shadow and is that seen and known among men resembling the original both before and after the original is dead and was also often seen of old to enter a house 
by which the people knew that the person of that likeness was to visit them within a few days this copy echo or living picture goes at last to his own herd it accompanied that person so long and frequently for ends best known to itself whether to guard him from the secret assaults of some of its own folks or only as a sportful ape to counterfeit all his actions kirk's secret commonwealth page three the two following apparitions resembling the vision of alan macaulay in the text occur in theophilus insulanus rev mr fraser's treatise on the second sight relations ten and seventeen barbara mcpherson relic of the deceased mr alexander macleod late minister of st kilda informed me the natives of that island had a particular kind of second sight which is always a forerunner of their approaching end some months before they sicken they are haunted with an apparition resembling themselves in all respects as to their persons features or clothing this image seemingly animated walks with them in the field in broad daylight and if they are employed in delving harrowing seed sowing or any other occupation they are at the same time mimicked by this ghostly visitant my informer added further that having visited a sick person of the inhabitants she had the curiosity to inquire of him if at any time he had seen any resemblance of himself as above described he answered in the affirmative and told her that to make farther trial as he was going out of his house of a morning he put on straw rope garters instead of those he formerly used and having gone to the fields his other self appeared in such garters the conclusion was the sick man died of that ailment and she no longer questioned the truth of those remarkable presages margaret macleod an honest woman advanced in years informed me that when she was a young woman in the family of grishornish a dairymaid who daily used to herd the calves in a park close to the house observed at different times a woman resembling herself in shape and attire walking solitarily at no great distance from her and being surprised at the apparition to make further trial she put the back part of her upper garment foremost and anon the phantom was dressed in the same manner which made her uneasy believing it portended some fatal consequence to herself in a short time thereafter she was seized with a fever which brought her to her end and before her sickness and on her deathbed declared the second sight to several end of note two end of a legend of montrose by sir walter scott